Welcome, my gentle and of course very modern apes. Welcome back to another episode of Skep Talk. Today is February 5th, 2024. I am your gentle and modern host, Erica, everyone's favorite uh, ape that refers to themselves in that way. And then my guest today is Jackson Wheat, who is, he's really, Jackson, you've been on the line like several times, different shows, different places. You've been here now. I I was on, uh, well, the first time was a few weeks ago with uh, Matt Dillahunty. So I feel like, I've, mm-hmm. have you been on since then? I feel like I've seen you twice. Yeah. No, am I mistaken? I, I guess so, unless I did it in my sleep or I you know conveniently what, forgot or something. It could have been a highlight post. It could have been like a, hey, here was an epic little snippet conversation between Jackson Wheat and Matt Dillahunty and, you know, deranged caller number four. <laughs> who, who knows? Those, yeah, those were, uh, we had some interesting callers. Uh, they all wanted to talk to Matt, uh, which is, is fine. It makes sense. He's he's the famous one of the two of us. So, yeah. Oh, Jackson, they didn't really have any like creationist call in. They were all like uh, trying to argue the, the like uh, ontology yeah. of, of like reality well, or whatever. So, <laughs> so here's like the wonderful part about Skep Talk though, because we get creationist colors here all the time, and so it is my hope, it is my deepest wish that this week we will be recapitulating the theme of the previous episode of Skep Talk that I was on with Grayson, and like every caller almost was a theist, and several of them were in fact creationists. So I'm hoping that we're going to get some creationist callers in here today. And like the nice thing about Jackson and and I is like, we don't care about what type of creationist you are. You're an old earth creationist, intelligence design advocate, YEC, or you know, the other fun ideas, like you you wanna tell us about your alien abductions or ghosts or, or some kind of psychokinetic powers. All of those are on the table for conversing with Jackson and I today because we love talking about this stuff. But of course, priority will always be given to those conversations that are like theist based and specifically allow us to muse and rant and ramble about evolution and why it's awesome and based. So please, if you're out there and you wanna call in and have a conversation with Jackson and I, you have a question about any of that kind of stuff, you're unsure, or perhaps you think you can convert us and like win us over to the YEC side here, live on air call in because the lines are in fact actually open and we are just so eager to get started today. Speaking of which, if you're the kind of person and you're like, I have a question about evolution or I have a question about, you know, a, a Jackson Wheat personally or Guts a Gibbon personally, we have to answer those super chats. So like if you super chat that bad boy in, we have to go over all of them at the end, regardless of what they say, even if it's like, you know, like pretty wild and out there. So feel free to super chat in your question if you don't want to call. But obviously the, the preference is I want to hear a lovely voice. I want you to call in and tell Jackson and I to our faces, to our ears. I want it to go through all three of my auditory ossicles. I want to hear what you have to say and why you feel you are perhaps right or just any cool questions that you have. So Jackson, before we get started here, how have you been? Fill me in, dude. I feel like I haven't talked to you in forever. Uh fine um just working at the aquarium uh same as usual which if you're ever in treeport come down to the aquarium uh i, I am not you on commission him, yeah. so you will see him in person you've been approached by people who recognize the wild. you before now in the wild i yes there was um there was a birthday party that we uh were hosting and the dad, or, or, or sorry, the, the little girl had like forgotten something in the party room. And so the dad came back to get it. And I'm one of the managers. So I'm just going in to make sure everything went fine and, you know, yeah. help kind of clean up. And he just turned around and goes, hi, Jackson Wheat. I was like, yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, I love your YouTube channel. And <laughs> You're like, uh, oh much, my God, you know, that's amazing. Similar to the Grinch, my ego grew three sizes that day. Yeah, so. right. And completely changed your disposition and outlook on life, right? When yeah, I, uh, yeah. last semester, I was recognized by a student for the first time. So, you know, I've been teaching for oh. a couple of semesters now, a couple of years now. Um, gosh, this is like my bazillion semester teaching bio and lab. And a student came in and I walked in through, it wasn't one of my students, right? It was like, I was, you know, taking over somebody else's lab. So I walked through mm. and I was like, I introduced myself, whatever. And the student comes up at the end and they're like, I, 
I recognize you. Your your guts a given. And I was like, huh, huh, hum and a hum and a You recognize <laughs> me? That's insane. I was like, oh my gosh. Like I think I was more flustered than they were, to be perfectly honest. It it truly was humbling. I was like on cloud nine for the rest of the month <laughs> over it. Yeah, it, it's it like definitely humbling. it's an experience, yeah, to get like recognized in the meat space by people who know you yeah. from the interwebs, you know, and I it's like it's it's very wild to me i i uh, i ta'd the botany lab um for several semesters mm. and the professor uh would always say yes you should subscribe to jackson wheat's youtube channel he, he loves my videos uh which i think is awesome um that is so awesome and i and think so, the, best, uh, the best i've gotten and when i say best i mean like this is this is my last little spiel on this because we actually have callers waiting and the first one i'm really excited to get to for you in particular jackson this question was tailor-made for you believe it or not so we'll get there oh in just boy. a second but, so picture this right i'm i'm going in to take my comps which for those of you who guys well to defend to do my oral defense so for those of you who don't know when you're a phd student um in order to graduate to being a candidate you have to take your your comps right it's a candidacy exam so you have to send in all these papers and you're like blah 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 blah, blah. here's all you know 215 papers on my subject matter and then you have to read all of those and then you basically take um tests for like three days for like eight hours a day on those questions on those papers and then they grade them and then if you pass that portion then you have to come in in a room with just your committee of people who know way more than you and defend your answers orally so i walk in and i'm just like I i've used like three sticks of deodorant right like i'm sweating i am so nervous i'm shaking i'm just like trying to do my breathing exercises and i walk in i just want to get this over with it's about to be like you know an hour and a half of just getting absolutely grilled by these people and then they just start talking about my youtube channel they're like yeah you, you erica you do the youtube right and we've seen some of your videos and both Blah, 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 blah. And have you ever considered covering this subject? And I was just like, please, can we get this over? <laughs> I don't want to talk. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Just do it already. Yeah. I'm just, mm -hmm. to carry out my institution. So, but our first call I totally today, Jackie, understand. You're you're gonna be hyped for this one. So this is Anthony, pronouns he him from Virginia. He is a theist and he wants to know what our best evidence for evolution is. Are you, is that not so exciting? Are you not just champing at the bit? So let's All invite right. Anthony. All right, Anthony, can you hear us? You are on Skeptalk. I can hear, yes, I can hear you. Can what? you hear me? Wonderful, I can. You're a little bit staticky. If you're on speaker, you might want to try being not on speaker. No, it's just like that. Yeah, it's just a bad connection and a bad, maybe it's a bad phone. Uh, this has been an issue, so. Hopefully, if it gets oh, too bad, uh, uh, let me know, and I'll try to maybe, I think sometimes holding the phone farther away from my mouth helps a little bit. Um, if you did that just but, now, it worked. Okay, I'll try to do it. I'll try to hold it like this then. All right, so, um, yeah, my my question is, as, as you said, I, I want to know what is you, well, before you answer, let me give my question and then kind of a little bit of uh, details and then I I'll let you go. Um, yeah, what is the what is the best evidence for evolution? And um, I just want to say outright that I've looked into the evidence for evolution. I I don't I don't see anything that has convinced me yet. Um, mm. But I guess my question is: if we use the definition of a change in allele frequency in a population over time. I completely accept that definition of evolution, and I think there's a lot of evidence for it, and it's strongly supported by science and observation. But when we define evolution as kind of a descent from a universal common ancestor where creatures can uh, evolve into com completely different kinds, and I know that word kind is kind of like a difficult to define word, I, that's the kind of evolution I don't see any evidence for. So my question really specifically is, is there any observed evidence that's not based on inferences about things that happened in the past that shows that one type of creature can evolve into another type of creature? So and I know you probably think there's a lot of evidence, but maybe we'll be able to go through a couple of things that you think demonstrate that. 
No, absolutely. I'm, I think Jackson, you start us off. I can see those gears turning because I've got I've got my spiel, but Jackson, this is like right up his alley. So he's gonna he's gonna start us off. And he's the guest, so he gets to go first. <laughs> oh, how kind. Thank you. Um I'm more intrigued by why you're taking a set of data off the table sort of a priori. Can you explain to me why you think inference is like unable to uh, answer this question at all? Or inferences about data? Uh, because I think it's that comes more down to interpretation of data as opposed mm. to things that we can repeatedly test. It's not that it's... Um, it's not that it doesn't demonstrate anything, but I really think that sometimes evolutionists, and again, I hate to use that word, but people who support evolution, they make claims about things that they think happened based on the evidence. And, I think, and, and to me, when you're talking about things that supposedly happened millions of years ago, that's more of an interpretation rather than a, a hard fact. So... I can see how it might convince people, but for me, it, it could easily be interpreted other ways. Whereas if you have something that we can look at in real time, that's much harder to deny as being a fact or true. So I'll give you an example of why that isn't true. Uh, my favorite, my go-to example for that uh, is always index fossils. So index fossils are, just for anyone who's not aware, they are fossils that are wide in uh, horizontal distribution, so that you find them all over, but in a very small window of time. So, for instance, um, oh shoot, uh, like you have different species of, of conodonts, which are these little jawless fish, or different species of ammonites, or snails, or uh, what have you. There are lots and lots of different organisms that fall into this category. Uh, they're typically invertebrates, although there are a few vertebrates uh, who meet that definition. And these organisms are separated, are stratified in the geologic column, not by size, but by species. So there's no explanation from creationists, as far as I've seen. I mean, there are some extremely tortured attempts at explanations for this distribution. But the favorite one that people always go to is, oh, what about hydrologic sorting? Well, that doesn't work because these are very, many of these are very nearly the same size. So you're not going to get hydrologic sorting by species. That's just not how water works <laughs> or sediment deposition. So I, I'm curious to know what a creationist um, explanation of the existence of index fossils could be. Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, Anthony, you're the the <clears throat> the sound that we're getting from your end too is like pretty bad. So I've I've been sort of asked to keep the answers like kind of concise from you, and I know that kind of sucks, but just because it's like pretty loud and like kind of abrasive. So if that's okay, just try to be like as concise as you can be. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. And all right. Sorry about that. I, I hate that these audio issues are a problem. But um, yeah, I do too. That sucks. So Okay, well, we'll try. We'll keep trying. Um, so basically, an index fossil is a fossil where there's similar kinds of creatures, but they're definitely different species that are arranged in a, an increasingly complex, uh, increasing complex. Not necessarily. On their, but they're, they go, there's a geologic column, and, and they, they're, they're stratified according to a geolog that geological column, right? They are stratified according to their species. It's not necessarily an issue of complexity because complexity, what, well, we don't really have a good definition of what complexity is. And I don't think that's a, a really relevant issue here. The point is simply um, they're stratified by species. That's, that's what I would say. Okay. Okay. So I guess my question would be, and again, not being an expert, I don't know all the facts. So I'm, I'm really just trying to get information. Is there like, okay. Um, a, a fossil deposit where there was like a very clear lower layer and then like a, an upper, uh, you know, it, it, you can see the different layers and all of these creatures exist in that same place. And as you go get closer to the surface, you know, there's different species arising. 
is that something that you mean like are they stratified by like where they are in their environment i guess i'm asking like is there literally a location on earth where you can Mm. see this this stratification or is it like they found a strata in england okay so they they will dig so what they do is they dig down and Mm -hmm. they they find um uh a strata like like 20 feet down there will be one stratum and then, you know, 16 feet, there will be another stratum, and they have different... Yeah, you can do, like, sediment cores. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess... Uh, well, I'm not a young Earth creationist, so uh, it, okay. it, it seems so that, to me that... That's, um, that's kind of, like, a good... That's. I mean, I think that's good, but, like, I... I think that a critical point here, right, is like because you aren't a young Earth creationist, right? What Jackson is saying about these index fossils, and not only are the index fossils in the sense that you've you've got this clear connection and local or, and multiple different local areas that unite them temporally, but they also evolve through time, right? So you can core down to like through yes. multiple different levels, crossing dozens of index fossils, and you can yes. see a, a form of of you know, for lack of a better term, plankton, right? change shape and form as you move up, change size, change like uh, specific adaptations for the type of environment that it's living in, which can then be cross-checked with the isotopic analysis of the environment that it is found within, right? So the, the, the case in point being, you're seeing organisms respond to change in time, changing through that time, and that is being cross-checked with the environment itself. So to Jackson's point here, right? You're seeing this change over time. And I would assume that your answer to this would be like, well, okay, but it's not becoming anything else, right? But that's not really what evolution ever actually says, right? You don't outgrow your ancestry for lack of a better term. Um, organisms adapt and change within their environments. And the the issue from the sort of uh, alternative perspective here, the intelligent design advocates or the old earth creationists is that we see change constantly in real time and we see it through the fossil record it meets predictions we've made within the fossil record and there is no genetic or otherwise stopping point that seems to prevent change up to a certain degree right like there is no genetic barrier that you can find that says organisms can only change this much before it becomes too much right and we've seen this as well in the lab right where you can take like hox genes body plan genes and tinker with them and under like like um, manufactured pressures, you can see these certain characteristics that that show up randomly or are introduced um, artificially speaking, take hold and fix in the population. So the, the point is, is Jackson's index fossils are like a wonderful example of multiple different sort of disciplines coming forward and converging on evolutionary theory being responsible for biodiversity today. So I may have misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> I apologize if I did. Uh, that was my fault. Um, I, I thought that you were contesting evolution because you were a creationist. That's why I went with. I was more asking why you. Um, why well, you I am taking, a creationist. Yeah. No, a young yeah, Earth creationist. I, just, I thought you were a young Earth creationist. Oh no, that's, yeah. that's why I went. Okay, no, that's why I went to that because I was I was confused about why you were taking inference off the table. But um, since you're not a young earth creationist. Uh, I mean, you can very easily accept the existence of index fossils. I, I would say that to answer your original question, then the um, the example that I would use uh, would be well. Can, can I stop the you fact for a second? Because I, I want to. I just want to ask about this. Okay. I just want to ask more detail. Like, I, I haven't studied sure. um, this. Particular. Is the sure. type of Go creature ahead. you mentioned? What was it? A a, con- a conovid or a, what was it called? a conodont? C O N O D O N T. Conodont. Okay. Oh, conodont. Okay. So, would this fall within the same? Would these would these organisms that are that we've found fall within the same range of diversity as, say, a dog in the different dog breeds? No, these are could, species could, to species transitions. Okay, so these, they're, yeah, they're, they're they're dogs are all within the same species, Canis uh, familiaris, or Canis lupus familiaris, okay. whichever one. Well, and dogs, um, dogs so, tend to be a poor, dogs tend to be a poor example of this. Like I, I hear this from creationists a lot. Like it's like, oh, if you found all of these different dog skulls in the fossil record, you would think that they were different species. Well, if every dog breed that we have today lived in the wild and they weren't the result of artificial selection, kind of maximizing the type of phenotypes that you can see within a single species, that species being determined more or less genetically in the case of dogs, like 
In the wild, a, a chihuahua is not actually capable of reproducing with a Great Dane. They would, mm -hmm. by the biological species concept, if they were in the wild, be considered separate species. Unequivocally, mm -hmm. they would. Right now, if you want to say, okay, well, if organisms can only like theoretically reproduce like with um, in vitro fertilization, well, then your definition of species becomes so incredibly squishy because that <laughs> type of uh, reproductive barrier is so flexible and fluid, even within singular families, right? Like, so, so what I'm saying is a dog isn't exactly the, the example that I think creationists tend to think that it is. Uh, because it only works using like colloquial understanding of of hybridization and species concepts, okay. and also species so are I'd, real. I'd, <laughs> who said that? And also, and also species are real. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to, if I can, Anthony, I'd like to give you my my best evidence for for evolutionary theory, and I think Jackson okay. will um, agree with this it, it, because it's extremely like intuitive and simple, right? Um, it is the genetic unity of all life. Right. No matter how you frame it, no matter what type of phylogenetic, phylogenetic test for phylogeny that you're trying to run, organisms fall into nested hierarchies and they fall into these nested hierarchies within their their functional DNA and within their non functional DNA. And that latter half is really important because you can't argue for common design in the latter half. Right. You might say, OK, well, organisms look similar and they, they map. They appear to be similar genetically because they they are designed commonly by a singular creator. Well, that makes sense for the genes that do something. But for the genes that are, for all intents and purposes, evolutionary leftovers, under a design model, those should not fall into a nested hierarchy and appear to be evolutionary in nature because they don't actually have a purpose. And we know that these regions are non-functional due in part thanks to um, knockout tests and things of that nature. But people have done statistical analyses on the types of like sections of genomes, right? You can consider them to be like ultra conserved regions of the genome. And folks have done genetics tests to see, not genetics tests, excuse me, statistical tests to see how likely is it should, that we would see the pattern that we see within all of the tree of life today if it is not the result of common descent. And that number is equivalent to picking the same atom twice subsequently in the universe with all of the atoms at your fingertips, right? It is absolutely incredible how precise the nested hierarchies are that we produce in genetics, right? And my area of specialty is, is primates, right? I'm a primatologist I'm, and I'm trying to get my degree right now in biological anthropology. So there's a really nice paper that actually Jackson pointed out to me years ago that took that exact concept, these nested hierarchies and constrained and unconstrained regions. And they said, how about we take it to the next level? We're going to compare that signal to morphologic or physical similarities between organisms and biogeography where they're found. And we're going to specifically test the evolutionary model of common descent with all of these organisms and all of these critters and those uh, separate signals with separate ancestry at the family level, which is what creationists typically propose is the level of these created kinds. And they were able to overwhelmingly reject family level separate ancestry because of the, like, the infinitesimal p-value that their analysis actually produced, right? Like the, the odds of getting the data set that we see with a separate ancestry model, with Cercopithecidae being a separate family from Aotidae or Atelidae and Hominidae, it's not going to work mathematically speaking. And to me, that's the best evidence for evolution, that genetics on its own seems to just scream at us that organisms are all related in areas of their genomes that do things and in areas that don't do anything at all, again, negating the common design theory, and that this is corroborated by where the fossils are found, if we're looking in the geologic column, and by the physical characteristics of the organisms themselves. And to add a cherry on top, in hominid evolution, this is also corroborated, or I shouldn't say corroborated, this is also supported by the fact that most of the time when we're looking for, for um, transitional species, whether it's in hominins or whether it's in, in, in tetrapods or whether it's in, um, you know, quote unquote, dinosaurs to birds, um, archosaur lineages, we'll say, we predict where these fossils should be based off of evolutionary assumptions. And then we go out and find them where they would be under evolutionary assumptions, right? Creationism does not do this. And they also don't have very much success in finding these types of fossils. They have to use evolutionary preconceptions to even interact with the data. So to me, all of those things together seem to just point a big 
neon red arrow at ding, 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 common descent, right? To, All organisms um, share a ancestor. Uh, to, to add to that, there was also a paper that came out in 2022 that compared uh, trees based on, so uh, phylogenetic trees based on uh, molecular data sets, morphological data sets, and biogeographic data sets. And you do get congruence yeah, among all of these. And the paper found that, uh, interestingly, biogeographic data sets uh, concur with molecular data sets uh, more often than morphological ones. But of course, there is that overall is congruence among all of these. So, so, yeah. All right. Well, that was that was a lot. So, um, OK, I, I, I see which so there are basically two main points that uh, have been brought up that I would like to engage with. And one was, was one that um, Erica brought up in an earlier part of the conversation where she said that there's no limit to um, kind of this, this evolutionary process. Which, um, I, I think that's mutable. But, we'll, but you, your, your, your most recent point about nested hierarchies and um, the, the stuff about non-coding regions of, of DNA is interesting. But let's just, let's just take as a, as a general principle. The, the I, and this is why I'm talking. This is why I'm talking about. To me, that doesn't convince me at all because, as I've, as you seem to be aware, these, this could just as easily be explained by common descent. If, if we just take as a general principle the idea that organisms that are morphologically more closely related, you would expect they would be. Uh, or also closely related genetically, they'd be using the same kind of code because so because they, they have done, again, yeah. So your problem with that though is like, and and you know, I I appreciate that like what I gave you is an info dump, right? My hope is that if you feel so inclined, you can go back and rewatch this and go go look into some of that, right? Because to me, evolution is is best supported by the tapestry of multiple different disciplines that all converge. It is that convergence mm. of different disciplines that is the singular best evidence, not any one discipline working in isolation. But to your point there, I, I the information is new, so like I, I can appreciate why it might not like, um, it, it might take a couple of listens because it certainly did with me when I was first uh, introduced to the argument, but it couldn't be common design. Like I, what I'm telling you is it, it literally cannot be common design because of those unconstrained regions, or excuse me, um, like non-functional is probably a better way of putting it for this conversation. Those non-functional regions also form nested hierarchies, right? So the, the regions of the DNA that don't do anything also recapitulate evolution. You as a, as a common design advocate can only use the functional regions of the DNA because those are what is, those are the, the regions that are responsible for um, sort of the, the, the nature of the thing, the archetype of the animal that you're considering, right? The, the phenotype, as it were. Yeah. But yeah. those those non-functional regions form the same nested hierarchy that falls in line with with evolutionary theory, and specifically evolutionary theory as it has been like and was originally predicted by basically every evolutionary biologist, right? Humans being closest aligned closest to the other apes and then to the the um uh the um catarine monkeys and then the anthropoids and then so on and so forth all the way up through the strepsorines and then mammals and and all the way down the line right so design doesn't work because before genomes were sequenced right before that technology was readily available before 2005 the the kitzmore versus dover trial the common design advocates, the intelligent design proponents were extremely clear that common design works because the regions of the genomes that are functional and do things are basically only appearing to form these, these patterns. But when the stuff that also doesn't do things forms those same patterns, you run into a bit of a problem, right? Because then you've kind of got a trickster, a trickster going on with God where he's saying common design for the things that do things, but also common design for the things that don't. All of it just appears like evolution. All of it just seems to look like evolution for no actual well, um, biologic well, that, purpose. See that, that sounds to me like a theological ar argument and not a scientific argument when you say, well, I don't think God would have done something like this because that would be deceptive so, of, of God. And well, go ahead, Jackson. So it's, uh, no, it's, I think there's a, I understand where you're going, but I, I think you're misunderstanding. That is a scientific argument. Um, you can make a prediction. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of the problem. You have to figure out what the what the uh, characteristics of the designer are, which 
yeah, it would probably be a theological thing. But we're what what Eric is talking about is you can make predictions about what we would expect under evolution versus what we should expect under design or what we could expect under design. Design can functionally predict anything. Design can predict any pattern and no pattern. Evolution can only predict one pattern. And that's the nested hierarchy that Eric is talking about. Well, I, I, I disagree. I think, I think the problem is, is that the nested hierarchies fall within the, the, the realm of both creationism and evolutionary predictions. So I don't think it, it establishes either, it either, either yeah, side's point. So, so I've, I've it, heard that according to, Anthony, they, there's been an attempt to try to turn this into non-discriminatory evidence. But what I think a lot of creationists forget is that the nested hierarchy that is universal to the tree of life has been the main point of evolutionary theory since its inception. And creationists have been dragged kicking and screaming into accepting, first, that, that species aren't fixed. Second of all, that change can occur at the genus level and then at the family level. And now you've got some creationists who will even accept um, phylum as the basis of the kind and they'll, they'll place it at the Cambrian explosion, right? So they're being dragged kicking and screaming to accepting each and every aspect of this. But what Jackson said is true. Evolution makes one prediction. It predicts one, ki if we're talking about common descent, the common descent axon, one mm. type of pattern that all organisms are related and that their genomes form nested hierarchies in functional and non-functional regions alike. And that those two nested hierarchies are the same nested hierarchy. And that is precisely what we see with zero exception, right? That I did, is I did, well, I think, it, here's the thing, I think you're wrong on the facts because <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, that um, within the last decade or so, due to genetic analyses, first of all, something that they, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember reading a lot of scientific publications, not from creationists, that said that the tree of life concept had essentially been eroded or destroyed by genetic no, analyses. that is wrong. Yeah, that's that's okay, so I actually just I just did a paper or I, I do we just watched a video about this from a creationist channel uh last Thursday. Uh, was no, it, that's was just, it deflate? Was it deflate? Um well we did uh yeah or, or sorry, not last week. We yes, we did watch Deflate's video on it. And the yeah. funny thing about Deflate's video is his I'm sorry, tangent for a moment, but his all of his um his arguments were like either just complete quote mines. Uh, about like one specific region of the tree, or he basically tacitly acknowledged that like the the larger roots or stem or whatever of the tree was fine. It was just kind of like the very outer tips, which is like exactly what we were arguing. We were like, yeah, there may be some disagreement about the very end tips with like which species is more closely related, but the 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 larger stems, there's not that as much debate over that. And he just kind of kept passing over that point. But but to your to your um. Uh, question anthony that that just isn't correct i mean it, just do a google search or a google scholar of like Google's phylogeny 2024 right. you know you're gonna find hundreds of papers probably already you know <laughs> and, and let me let me well, let me, let me ask so hold on real quick anthony because i think this is important to your point right this the nature of this being non-discriminatory because evolution can make an additional prediction here and we can look to an additional um line of evidence right so if, the, if all organisms are related, then to achieve modern day biodiversity, we should see the emergence of modern forms through geologic time. And this should be in accordance with, with um, radiometric dates and, and molecular clocks, for instance, so mutation rates and things of that nature. Um, and not only do molecular clocks, like when we've got the data available to us, the mutations looking at specific species, not only do they align with the geologic rates of divergence, and I'll speak for the hominins specifically, like when, when different hominin groups split from one another, and then when different hominid groups split from one another, when hominid, hominoids split off, like the um, hylobatids and things like that, not only do all of those match, but we find the transitional fossils themselves, right? There is zero yeah, again, reason. Again, you're introducing it. Okay. Well, no, because the, the problem with, with your idea of inference here, Anthony, is that that is necessarily, again, true under the evolutionary model, but there is no prediction for transitional forms under the creation model, right? So, like, 
this this is just Lego brick on top of Lego brick that okay. creates this wonderful um, citadel of of thought, of let, theory. Let me, well, let, let me let me um, all right. So let me ask let, or say something that I, I think is probably going to annoy you, but this is what I'm talking about with interpretation. You interpret these fossils, and I you know I know Archaeopteryx, I know Tiktaalik. These are things that are interpreted as transitional fossils but there's simply no scientific empirical way of verifying that. So are these transitional so, creatures or are they just kind so of I'm, like uh, mosaic creatures that have so, all right. similar traits? I'm going to give you, I'm going to go, well, I'm going to go hard on hominins here for a minute. Jackson, would you like to go first before I go on my spiel? Okay. I mean, you mentioned Archaeopteryx. I've uh, fairly recently become familiar with like the, actual characteristics of Archaeopteryx that define it both as a bird and as a, or well, as an avialin, uh, not, not necessarily as avies, um, and also as a larger dinosaur. Uh, are you familiar with the characteristics of Archaeopteryx, Anthony? Yeah, I know it's basically, it, it has the characteristics of a bird and a reptile. It has teeth and it has claws and it has, you know, fully formed feathers. And it looks like it moves like a reptile, more so than a bird. So it, it could be seen as something along the lines of a hybrid creature or a mosaic creature. A hybrid. I, well, I mean, mosaic, uh, well, mosaic has a specific ter terminology in, uh, in evolution. I mean, like, you, mosaic doesn't mean like it's a hybrid. Mosaic means that your traits don't evolve all at the same rate, uh, which is fine. That's, that happens in evolution all the time. Okay. Um, but, um, I mean, yeah, Archaeopteryx has these characteristics that you just mentioned, and there are lots of other ones uh, that all the characteristics that all dinosaurs share among them. Like if you look at Tyrannosaurus if you look, and Stegosaurus and Triceratops, the characteristics that all three of them share, the three you know, representatives of the three major lineages of dinosaurs. Those are also all the characteristics that Archaeopteryx has, whether it's the fourth trochanter, the open acetabulum, the mesotarsal ankle joint. These are all things that all dinosaurs have, all birds have. You know, Archaeopteryx has them also. In addition to the teeth and the bony tail and the unfused wing fingers, also like dinosaurs and unlike any modern birds, there are no modern birds that have unfused wing fingers or a bony tail or or, or teeth. Um, and so you, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how... Let me ask this, let me ask this question. Let me ask this question. <laughs> this, is why I, this is why... I, I, I know you just question asked about almost any line of evidence, but could God have created a creature with bird-like characteristics and reptilian characteristics? Could the universe have been created God, last it, Thursday? It, it, I mean... <laughs> if, if God exists, if, uh, if God exists, could God create a creature? This is why this. I think this doesn't work for a theist, because according to this model, a creationist, God could have created that creature just like that, and it would yeah. appear to be a transitional so, form. So, yeah, but the problem is... Hold on, well, let, me, let, me, let me finish, let me finish, let me, let me finish. We, didn't, we, did, we can't see where this creature evolved from, and we can't sure we see can. that it evolved into we any... Can. Hold on, and we... we, 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 we so we, you, you absolutely you, can. So you can see the creature we, from which this creature evolved, and it's a different kind of... Or, or different... It's a completely different kind of creature, and if, this, if there's actually a fossil that that shows this transition really? from whatever to, to Archaeopteryx to the next thing that is shown I mean, in the yes, fossil there record. Are more, there are more basal, like avialins in the fossil record, more basal manoraptorins, more basal theropods, more basal, you know, uh, ava metatarsalians, etc. Yeah, you can go in either you direction. Go you want to go up more trait towards trait. more. Yeah, like Character more advanced. You wanna, trait by trait. Yeah, if you want to go towards like, okay, well, how do we get from Archaeopteryx to modern birds? You can go like, you know, you can look at like Hesperornis and Ichthyornis and Antiornis and, and all these other uh, more advanced birds. Or you can go the other direction. You're like, okay, well, you know, what about uh, the Dromaeosaurs and Ovaraptorosaurs and, and all the other Manoraptorans? They have a set of characteristics and theropods in general. Yeah, you can do that in either direction. It's perfectly possible. So, oh, and let, no, me, no, no, let me... Well, hold on, hold on, Anthony. Go I, I, I want to, I want to give my, I want to give my example here, right? Or, and before we get started, I want to ask you a question: are, are you, in your opinion, are humans and other apes a part of the same kind? No. Okay, so 
there is zero physical characteristic that differentiates humans from other apes, right? We are members of hominidae. Every single characteristic that classifies and separates out chimpanzees from gibbons, from baboons, from mandrels, from uh, any New World monkey, from tarsiers, from streptorans, every single characteristic that applies to chimpanzees to make them unique also applies to humans, also applies to gorillas, also applies to orangutans, and if we're looking at apes generally, also applies to gibbons. So physically speaking, humans are 100% morphologically apes. And this is something that even the earliest creationists like Carl Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus classically, recognized. In fact, he chose to elevate the other apes up to the human level and, and called us anthropomorpha instead of denigrating the other apes to the exclusion of humans. We and them share every physical characteristic. This is also recapitulated in our genome. We are more closely related to chimpanzees and more genomically similar to them than lions are to tigers, than African and Asian elephants are to one another. We are ridiculously similar genomically. So this makes a very simple prediction, right? If though both of those things are true and humans are apes, then we should have fossil evidence that we emerged from a previous more basal ape and that chimpanzees did as well. And if you use the molecular clock, that puts that divergence date around 7 million years ago, which is when we find, say, Helanthropus chidensis, the very first ape that is starting to take on hominin characteristics, like smaller canine teeth and, in a, and a more erect posture. As you continue through geologic time, going to 6 million years ago with the Roaring Tugenensis, 4.4 million years ago with Artipithecus ramidus, approximately 3 million years ago with genus Australopithecus, and expanding into 1.98 million years ago with other later members of that, you see the emergence of genus Homo. These things start to stand up upright way before then. And then you see the expansion of the brain case size, the flattening of the face, the minutia of the cusping of the teeth, the, the encephalization um, on the inside with endocasts and things of that nature. All of this occurs stepwise, piecemeal, through geologic time. And you see the emergence of the anatomically modern human condition, like approximately 300,000 years ago. Um, it's more archaic at that point, right. but you know, we're splitting hairs. None of that should be true, and none of that should converge simultaneously under, um, under a model that does not have humans as sharing a common ancestor with apes, other apes. OK. Well. There's a number of, of things here, and I want to I want to stress again, going back to my original question, when we're talking about things that supposedly happened, on, you know, millions of years, tens of millions of years ago, or hundreds of millions of years ago, I just feel like that opens up for a wide uh, possibility for interpretation of data, as opposed to saying this is something we can observe and verify that our what we're thinking is correct. So we can uh, when you said that, that now. Well, hold, we're genetically and physically I, I, apes now, though, are we not? Genetic, ge genetically, it, it, again, as I've said, the genetic let's, similarities are complete. Well, let, hold on, let me let, let when you, you will finish. When you said and that, then I, when, you, I, when you said that, yeah, when you said that humans are a hundred percent apes. Okay, well, yes. clearly we're not. We're at least ninety. We might be ninety nine point nine percent similar to the other apes. But the whole reason there's a, a classification of, of humans and other apes is because there isn't. There no, is no, we're in the no. no what Anthony, she means is we're in the, the ape group. Yeah, yeah, we, we are 100% ape because we're in hominidae. That's that's what she's saying. We're we're 100 apes in the same way a dog is 100 percent a canine, right? right. A canine okay, well, is these, a type of is, animal, and an ape is a type of animal. We are 100 percent apes, and there is zero getting out of that genetically, physically, okay, well, through the geologic record, all of it. We're not we're not a hundred percent chimpanzees, are we? That's not no, what she's saying. Not. Not sure. That's not what. Okay, yeah, okay. So, so what what what, 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 we're, what we're dealing with? I was going to say this. What we're dealing with is an arbitrary classification system. It's that not. That so. doesn't demonstrate that these these organisms can transition from one to the other. You can call them apes. That's well, fine. I think so, I what my my point is that a, a chimp or a chimp or a, an ancestor between chimps and humans cannot make it to human. That's what we're trying to demonstrate. How you classify them is, is irrelevant, right. almost. So you let's, find, let's, you find precisely let's, that. Let's Go flip ahead. this. Let's flip this for a second, because uh, this is something we tried with a creationist uh, guy I had on my channel the other day. Are you related to people from, to native Tasmanians? Uh, Do you share I a mean, common ancestor with people who are with native Tasmanians? Do you know? If you go far back enough, yes. How do you know? 
That was like tens of thousands of years ago. How do you know you share a common ancestor with them? Because uh, it makes sense that uh, there had to be a beginning to Why? however long ago that was, that Why? there has to be an original human, human somehow. Why? And all humans will be descendants. Why? Because, uh, because humans exist. So we observe humans existing. So okay. I've never observed the we, common we ancestor knew. between us and Tasmanians. Well, okay. I, I would Any just argument say that you make is going to make is going to rely on inference. You you know that right? That's the point I'm trying to get at. That's, you're gonna, that's not necessarily. And genetics. Really true. Yeah. You're going to rely well, on genetics. In this, you're in this, rely in this on argument, yeah. yeah, and, okay, and, so, and with genetics. So where's the so, where's the where does it stop? And right, why does so it stop? You have to, Right, so you're going to have to rely on genetics and morphology because we're humans and the, what classifies us as humans is our genetics and morphology and our development. And so you're going to have to turn to that. And so we're going to ask you, why do you stop there? Why do you stop with Tasmanians, but you don't just keep applying the same logic to get us to because chimpanzees? I, I will, because we see humans giving birth to humans and this goes back thousands of years, and we see chimps going, giving birth to chimps, it, it seems to me that we don't have any... What, I'm, what I would like for you all to present to me is evidence of you start with one thing and you end with another, and we've observed this. Oh, I'm sure, not getting that. That's getting, easy. I, uh, oh, okay, well, hold on. So far, so far, so far... Wait, so far... I understand. Oh, let me just finish. I just want to finish. Okay. So far, every piece of evidence you've given me is based on things that you believe happened a long time ago, but which cannot be reproduced in a scientific experiment to prove that, yes, Tiktaalik is a transitional form. Our you can't reproduce our common this. ancestor with Tasmanians. And you've never seen someone of whatever your ancestry so, is we, but it's, the birth of Tasmanian, have you? That's true. So we, we can observe human, so we, we can observe humans giving birth to humans. Not so the Tasmanians. Not a stretch to say not no one. Tasmanians, no, not Tasmanians. You haven't seen no somebody my... a Spanish okay. person give birth to a Brit. You've not seen right. a American give birth to an Indian person. Like, well, they're Native American yeah. too, but you know what I'm saying. Right. You've not observed this. Yeah. You're using inference and you're using genetics, most importantly. Why does genetics okay. connect well, things, Anthony? What What about genetics connects people? Why can you make well, a family tree? I'm curious about that. What what makes a family tree? How do you do that? What what, what tool are you, you using when you make a family tree you, or a you, paternity? If you're making it, if you're making a family tree, it means you know who gave birth to whom and no, the whole don't. lineage. Not necessarily. Yeah, you weren't there. Yeah, you weren't there. So how do you know? You use Somebody. genetics, don't you? You use genetic similarity between people because you are more genomically similar to your sibling and your sibling to you than either of you is to your cousin. And then you guys as a triad are more genomically similar than any of you is to a stranger and so on and so forth. And you coalesce on a common ancestor between the three of you. And that's how you create okay. a tree okay. using plus, genetics. We don't always have records of every person giving birth to each person. I mean, or orphans happen, you know, people uh, lose their family and, you know, when they're very young and no one has records and things like that. And so you may not know who exactly, the parents may be, but you can connect that person to a population, usually the one that they're living in, through genetic testing, right? We can do genetic testing, right? Right. right. Okay, so, so if we can connect people to with populations genetics. with genetics, even though no one may have witnessed, we have no idea who this person's parents are or their grandparents or who their relatives are, but we can still connect them genetically to a population. Like, you, you agree that that's okay, right? We can do that. It, it, it's yeah i would say that that's acceptable right well let me okay, add something then... onto that too. like just as a quick thing jackson right like mm -hmm. you can do that with dog breeds too you can take different dog breeds map their genome mm -hmm. and create a phylogenetic tree with dog breeds despite the fact that they are physically incredibly divergent from one another i would wager that there's more physical difference between a great dane and a chihuahua than there is between a human and a chimp and you accept that genetics and morphology can create a tree that way, don't you? Even though you weren't there to see the emergence of every breed. Right. So, yeah, I, I would agree uh, that dogs, we can trace them back to probably a common ancestor. Yeah. So, 
And so but we can connect populations, different, you know, breeds or, guess, or varieties or whatever. So we can do that, even though, again, we haven't directly witnessed either of these things. But but, well, when, when, but I think when you talk specifically about dogs, what we observe is, is in conflict with what Erica said earlier, is that there, there aren't any limits. We've, we've hit the limit. It seems How do like you know? why did we why do you know? a dog? What why, date are you drawing why? on? Yeah, we we see new dog breeds I, every single year. I, well, I, I'm just I'm me. just saying. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me something that do, that dog breeders have created that isn't clearly, you know, a dog. Is, That's how do you not know possible. possible. I know that. I mean, it's I'm just, just saying. Like evolution, evolution says that you know we should be able to get from like a, a rat to a dog. Or something like Wait, that. I know I'm that's sorry. not what you, got, you claim. I, oh, hold on, hold on. I'm so sorry, Anthony. You went from a gray wolf to a freaking chihuahua. Is that a joke? Are you kidding me? That's basically a rat. You've got Have something you ever seen that is how in, big you know, gray wolves yeah, are? It, like when I stand you're, up, you're, they're like up to here on me. <laughs> well, and and besides that, again, the difference between a gray wolf and a chihuahua is larger than the difference if you're just counting off morphologic traits. The difference between a human and a chimp. So by your own logic. Even if you couldn't get all common ancestry, which I think we've demonstrated by several different lines of evidence that that's certainly where the arrow is pointing, you can at least get from a chimpanzee-like critter to a human. I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that, that... Why not? You think you can to, go to a chihuahua it, from a gray wolf, don't you? Yes, Unless you the, don't accept that chihuahuas what, are descended from gray wolves. No, I do. I, I think that they, they, they are. And I, I think that genetic analyses have been done, to, you know, demonstrating that we, we know basically what, what genes mutated. This is what I'm talking about. They, they know when they look at a chihuahua's genome, they can see exactly what changed yes, between can. that creature and the wolf. Ding, 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 ding. They, That's how you know the humans and chimpanzees are related because the difference between humans and chimps is smaller than that between African and Asian elephants, which I would wager that you would consider to be related between lions and tigers, which I would wager that you would consider to be related and baboons and macaques, which I would wager you would consider to be related. So now you've got uh, yeah. genetics and morphologic differences both being spanned that it, like, within the bounds of things you already accept. Which leads me to say, the only reason you don't accept humans and chimps is because humans are involved, and you think humans are special. No, that's that's, you that's not that's not it at all. I, you accept to you allow for a great deal of it. What's the difference? The difference is that as as you get farther away from the wolf uh, prototype, the the organisms become less less and less fit. And they start to develop no all sorts of, that. of. Hold on, let, well, let me no just get. Let no, me just, just let no me say why I believe what. Okay, okay, well, is a chihuahua as fit to survive as a gray wolf? In Anthony, its environment, what is fit? They, yeah. <laughs> what, what's fitness? How many chihuahuas are on the planet, yeah, and how many it, gray wolves are on the planet, and which one is more fit? It, it, okay, I, <laughs> if you it, all right, let's let's let's. Uh, I understand that. But we're talking about in a natural environment where these things would have had to evolve. No, because you, that's not where you, dogs you, originated. Dogs did not originate fit? in a natural environment. They originated under the care of humans. So this is a nonsense right, that's argument. Why all, say, that's why basically all dog breeds are less fit than, than that has nothing, wolves what is fit in a no, natural environment. Answer that's, Erica's that's question. What, define fitness, What's please. Fitness? What is fitness? What, what was the question? What is, what is fitness, fitness in the, an evolutionary sense? Fitness what is, is fitness? Fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce in in, a, in an environment. Okay, so to, to again ask Erica's question, uh, how many chihuahuas are there on the planet relative to gray wolves? Uh, I would, there are a lot more, but the point hmm. is... Okay, so chihuahuas are, are, give birth and survive, and their offspring survive way, way more on average than gray wolves. So evolutionarily you just speaking, the definition of fitness. Fit. But yeah. uh, I, I hold on, I, I, and we gotta we gotta bring this to a close in a second because we got a bunch of other okay. colors waiting. And right. as fun as this has been, and I'm sorry to kind of cut us off here, um, but I I I think you've got like your work cut out for you here, Anthony, right? Because like you've got this range of things that you clearly accept, 
And I, I noticed that there was a, an interesting little route away from the topic with talk, going from talking about change that you allow and relatedness within a genetic context to being about fitness, right? And I'm sure that eventually that would have been a genetic entropy conversation, which is a story for another time. Um, but I, I really think that you should look at the standards that you're using to assess what type of change can actually occur because you, you've kind of already bought the whole cow here, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, Jackson, do you have right, anything else one, to say? Let me say one more. I want to say one more thing. I just want to say one more thing, and, and then I'll be done. Yeah, I think shoot. so. My my, ori my original question was uh, evidence that is repeatable and, and observable, and the, that what I got there. You gave me a lot of lines of evidence, which are based on inference about things that happened a long time ago. But the only thing I got about c current observable data is dog breeds. Okay, so that's I just want to let you know that's where I'm at. Well, and most of our the argumentation, field of genetics. I mean, most of our all argument of was about getting you to accept that that you do allow for inference, but only for the things that you a priori accept. So, which is like it was all special pleading. So. Thank you for this. Anyways, Anthony, this was a great conversation. And um, I hope you call back next time or reach out to Jackson or I. I know both of us would be happy to have you on the channel and, and dissect this a little bit more in depth. Until then, take care of yourself. So, Jack, okay, he is back in the queue. Um, okay, I thought that was super fun. I thought that was a really fun conversation. Um, you really hit the nail on the head with the inference thing, though, Jackson. It's It's interesting to see what what is allowed and what isn't and there is exactly zero objective criteria to decide what is and what isn't within his perspective well yeah i cool. and uh dapper and i uh when we talked to robert uh i always mispronounce his last name uh grown uh, growing i don't remember uh it's g-r-o-e-n i know peter will yell at me um but yeah it's what we got him to accept just like with this guy is um it's always, 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 and Erica, you know this from all the creationism you've read and watched, is it's always special pleading in the end. They'll always allow mice and rats to be related, lions and tigers, oh. uh, different elephants, but the, literally the exact same line of logic with no changes whatsoever connecting humans and chimps, and suddenly, no, no, we can't do it, sorry. Well, and that's, that's, why, that's why human evolution is such a, a thorn in the side of creationism in general, because it's so personal and it, it feels like such a, it feels like so icky to them a lot of the time, I think, that it's like, they're like, of course all the felids are related. Of course all the canids are related. Yeah, mice and mm -hmm. rats, well, the muridae, that's totally fine. And then it's like, oh, cool. Well, like humans and chimps though, right? Or hell, humans and orangutans are more are more genetically similar than a lot of the pairs within those families. But it's like, oh, no, 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 that's clearly, that is clearly very different. And it's like, it simply isn't. We have a better fossil record for, for humans for prominent evolution than many lineages that we have in these other major groups. We have the, the genomic work out the was because we're so narcissistic and the morphologic change fits very well within like modern dog morphologic diversity. So it's like, what is there left? As you said, special pleading, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Let's go to our next question. So, oh, we have another theist. I hope they will stick around. We're gonna do Loon next. They are next on the list from New York, pronouns they, them. They're an atheist and they would like a good reason to disbelieve other than a lack of evidence. Hold on just a second. Loon, can you hear us? I can hear you, am I audible to all? Wonderful, yes, yes we can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Did you all, uh, hi, Jackson. Hi, Erica. How are you two doing tonight? Hi, we're well. How are you? I'm doing okay. I have a little bit of stubble in my right eye, but other than that, I'm fine. Watery. Yeah, that's not ideal. Tell us a little bit about your question, and your audio is coming not in ideal. and out just a little bit. Yeah, Let me, I how's did. this? Is this better? Is this, is this better? Are you that's booing me? I'm right. Yeah, uh, my question is, and I have kind of an answer I'd like to share, but you guys can share first if you don't if you want to. My question is, what is, and I'm a newly, uh, kind of a recent atheist, um, so, you know, recent to the club, um, but what is a good reason to believe beyond just there is no lack of 
there is a lack of evidence to believe or for both. Jackson, you want to start off? I want you to go. Um, Yes. I I don't typically talk about atheist arguments because my my channel is more zoology geared. Um, But in my humble, my extremely humble personal opinion, um, I would say that the track record of science, the history of science itself is an argument uh, against theism um i don't like the the personally i don't like the the oh i just i don't believe um or the like i'd lack a belief uh, lack of belief or whatever um i prefer to say like what we know about the world is that methodological naturalism works it produces um all sorts of uh wonderful uh, results about the world i mean here we are talking on the computer you know across space from each other so um it has told us uh you know how the universe works it tells us that we all share common ancestry that the universe is 14 and a half billion years old um and all we find consistently when we look at the world uh when we apply uh naturalistic um uh, uh you know processes is just more naturalism we have yet to find any evidence so far of miracles miraculous uh claims or uh even like spooky things like you know telekinesis or astrology or what have you at all we have a very rigorous set of rule of like you know rules by which atoms are governed and interact with each other and this is necessary to produce everything in the universe so that's what i typically right. say erica anything to add yeah i mean yeah, I mean, I so so as our as our resident fence sitting agnostic, right? Like, I I tend to go more for like, what can we support, and then what can we preclude with that as well, right? Because like, it's not just not having support for something. There are types of of data, right? There there is a type of evidence that is preclusionary in nature. So like, for example, we know that the Earth is four point like let's say four point five to four point eight billion years old, right? The evidence for that is completely preclusionary to young earth creationism in any religion that it exists, right? So if you're a young earth creationist, you happen to be Muslim or young earth creationist, you happen to be Hindu, whatever, all of those are getting booted out by by the support of the ancient age of the earth, right? Or, or the common ancestry of all life on earth. There are specific types of belief systems that that's also going to boot, right? Um, there have been extensive investigations, to my understanding, into things like reincarnation and near-death experiences. And my understanding is that what we have found with regards to those is not much. And because of that, the, the data is sort of beginning to stack against those as ideas. I'm not necessarily saying that they you know, are, are impossible, but we don't have support for them at present. And so I, I think it's okay to say, look, like, I, I don't personally buy it because there's not support for it. That's not you saying that 100% we definitively know that this is false. It's just saying there's not support for it. And so at present, there's not a good reason to put your eggs in those baskets. Right. And, um, and I, I think that that's an honest way of looking at the world from my perspective. Right. Me too. I agree with, <clears throat> excuse me, I agree with you, Jackson, when you say you're a methodological naturalism or naturalist. And I agree with you both, Erica. Uh, for me, I would say, you know, when I looked at the whole, I, was, I came out of Christianity, recovering Christian. You know, when I came out of Christianity and said, and when I looked at the whole of the text of the biblical literature and other literature, you know, religious in nature, I said, listen, these read kind of like what Mozart and Beethoven would have been writing at three years old if they were fiction writing. And it's just like bad fiction or even even good fiction in a way, if you say. Um, but they just don't offer any kind of common sense or reasonable, logical, deductive kind of uh, answers for why the world is here and why the world operates in the manner in which it does, or in the universe. Does well, yeah, and like, well, you know, 
yeah, for, for, for me, right. Like I, I'll again, speak, speak for myself here. Right. Is that it's like, it, to me, it, a lot of it. And my experience is personally with Christianity. Cause that's, that's sort of the angle that I'm coming from. So that's where I feel most informed. Um, it reads a lot like something people have written. Um, it reads a lot like something that you would write if you wanted to convince a lot of people to do the thing that you want them to do. You know, it's like, man, those Canaanites they sure do have a sweet spot down there. Too bad God told me that it's time for them to uh, to to ship up and ship out because we're coming down there to completely annihilate them, wipe them from the face of the earth. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like that that seems like the classic, almost tribalistic in-group, out-group perspective that you tend to see from humans, whether you're looking at it from a religious perspective or otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. And that, I find that kind of alarming, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little Monkeys bit concerning. Fight. Yeah, monkeys fight, they do. And and that's what we are, cattle and monkeys. So, um, but yeah, so I, I very much empathize with that perspective of like t kind of looking at it with a new set of eyes and being like, hmm, this reads, like what, what exactly separates it out from some of the other ancient Near East texts that are also in existence at that time that, and the things that they claim, right? There's some similarities there and through into other cultures as well, like all across the world. I mean, we're people, we're curious and we liked, like to assign meaning to things and find patterns in things and feel like we figured something out. And then we also like to justify the things that we do. So I think that, right. yeah. Yeah. I, even you when know, I, I feel like I try to be like really charitable to, um, to religious belief because I'm not an anti-theist or anything like that. Um, and, when I, and I like follow uh, like, you know, inspiring philosophy uh, mm -hmm. and a few other people who are, uh, who I consider um, very respectable uh defenders of christianity and so uh, we know things that they would say first of all is like well the way that young earth creationists like you know take certain aspects of the bible like genesis they take it you know too literally oh, okay fine fair enough uh they also take you know okay well exodus didn't really happen you know as it's described uh, okay all right or, or judges or deuteronomy or and it's like oh, okay all right well okay so none of this so all this historical background is you know, uh, is is narrativizing uh, our origin story. Mm, okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, and and yeah, and it's, it's and so you start to kind of work like, okay, well, this thing, you know, at the very best, we can't say it happened. Uh, and there's this other thing that, at the very best, oh, we can't say it happened. It kind of seems like it probably didn't happen. And it's and yet, as Erica said, it's like, yeah, it really seems like these are these are just origins. These are origin stories. Uh, meant to convey a like a national belief or or a tribal belief, and you know like the the Bible itself is a collection of stories written by different authors across different times. And who I sounded like Ken Ham for a second there, um, but <laughs> but I mean it's you know yeah. to an extent that's true. That, that is true. Uh, <laughs> these are stories written at different times by different people, uh, sometimes in different languages. And so like you and because there isn't that like singular narrative uh, among all of these and there are a lot of things that either we don't have evidence happened or evidently didn't happen it does just seem like it's things written by people right so yeah yeah you know and the one thing is is i think beyond just an origin story that you know uh the religious traditions of the world are trying to get at i think for the most part uh their religion uh, in a whole, is trying to answer the question of death. It's trying to answer, you know, what happens when we die, why do we die, and where do we go after we die? And the reason that religions, I think, were created was to um, was to act as a panacea for those fearful questions. Sure. I mean, to an extent, sure. Uh, every, or most religions, I think, have some aspect of uh, what happens to you after you die or where you were before you were born. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think I think that's part of it. I don't think that's the whole thing, but that's certainly part of it. I mean, we it seems kind of inconceivable to people like that, you know, we're here and we're having this experience. We represent this dynamic pattern that changes, but feels like it's us, right? And it's like, we can't even conceive that that dynamic pattern can stop, right? Like that, that's it's almost like trying to imagine the vastness of the universe or the, the, the age of the universe or the expansion of whatever, right? Like it's, it seems to me like it's almost something that it's just very difficult for us to wrap our heads around. And so we kind of just say, well, 
maybe it doesn't stop. I don't know. Maybe it just keeps going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there are lots yeah. of different hypotheses for, you know, the origin of religion and some of them probably have more uh, substance than others. Um, like, you know, there's the, the like hyperactive uh, pattern recognition uh, process. And then there's, yeah, there's like, you know, maybe it's an existential crisis thing or um, maybe it's a combination thereof, you know, maybe. Uh, right. You know, because religion does obviously serve a bunch of different functions, like really from death, but it also is involved in community building. And religion is very, very good at building communities. It's way better than than uh, secularism. You know, so well, hopefully well, it's one we'll of those get things that where, as it goes by. Yeah, well, yeah, true. But I, I also like I, I talked about this with Grayson last week, right? Like, it almost seems like through time, like you've got you've got religion being the initial unifier within that within that um that community space right but as time has moved on right different ideologies if you will or like belief systems whether it's you know political that seems to do a pretty good job these days of unifying people um especially if you've got a nice out group to point that and <laughs> admonish and pour all your your hatred on right like that seems to be a pretty good modifier and a, or uh yeah it it motivates you Motivator? Motivator. 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 That's it. Motivator. Yeah. Motivator. I'm an idiot. It's a pretty good motivator um, no. to get people moving towards a common goal, right? And then, like in the modern era, you start to see it around like shared interests too. Like the, the you know the 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 world is bigger than it's ever been, and also smaller than it's ever been. So you can share your interests with other people and and form um, relationships on those bounds. Whereas like taking it back in time, there was kind of less to pick from, and it's interesting because like. It seems like these days, especially there moving back in like the past, yeah, there weren't any foot. What are you gonna do? You know, like, it's, <laughs> but wars are more often they seem to be fought on political grounds than they were on than they are on religious grounds. And like, we moving way back in time, there. Not that's not to say none are today on religious grounds, but it seems like there's been a sort of a paradigm shift there, and like what we as humans deem as worth fighting over. Um, and it's different depending on where you are, too. So I don't know. I, I think religion still plays a, a pretty big role in society and civilization as a whole today globally, but I don't think it's as large of a role as it has been in the past. Um, that's right. just my perspective. One, one thing I really struggled with when I, when I first started to kind of deconvert and deconstruct was these two kind of fighting questions of like, uh, well, God always existed. You know, that was what the Christians would say, and God is the cause, the uncaused, causeless mover. But like, and then the atheists would say, well, what do you say about that? why, why can't the universe just have always existed? And even though they're both hard questions to answer, since the universe always existed is more naturalistic and reasonable, I think that's the only if so facto default position that anyone, any reasonable and logical thinking person can and should take. And well, I think from a, yeah, from a secular perspective as well, I think you tend to be more comfortable being like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. Like, has the universe always existed or did it come into being with the big you know, being as we understand it with the Big Bang? Has it been going back and forth? Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm perfectly comfortable sitting here and being like, I have no idea, right? Like, I am not plugged in enough into that space to know what the, what the dominant, like, hypothesis or theory set of ideas uh, is for that right now. But like, you'll notice that when, when you say that kind of stuff around folks who are like really starkly religious, not like saying, I don't know, makes them extremely uncomfortable. And that is kind of sad, right? <laughs> that kind of bums me out. Cause like, I, I know, you know being able to, I have a big brain. So I know all things you know, actually. Jackson, reveal, reveal <laughs> it to us. <laughs> I will. It'll be in your dreams though. I can only reveal okay, it in dreams. Right. Can no. I start a religion on it? Is that okay? I'm, what you do with your time is your business. You know, Sounds good. Free country. Anyways, all. the bottom line is um, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, Jackson, Erica, I thank you so much. And Erica, don't worry about it. Last fall with all those burgers and bourbon you stuck in the hair. It really hurt. It sounds like it's getting but farther away from the phone. Loon, it, oh, I couldn't hear you there now? for a second. Yes, oh, I can Eric, now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, Erica, yes. trust me with all the with all the wordage and verbiage that uh, made no sense to me, and it really hurt my brain. Uh, you should you should really have no trouble getting your doctorate. Seriously. 
that is so sweet of you to say because every day that I chip away at it, I feel stupider and stupider. But I think that's kind of what, how you're supposed to feel when you're working on a dissertation. I've been told that that's how you're supposed to feel. So well, you I made, you made me feel ex- you made me feel extremely stupid listening to your last call. I was like, how no, am I you- going to make any headway with these people? Man, I'm I'm fortunate in that I've got a hobby and really a, a, a side job. This you know, if we're going based off of earnings, my main job, because they don't pay you a lot in grad school, but it's like, I'm fortunate to get to sit around and talk about the stuff that I find interesting. And you get, it's easy to sound smart when you're talking about stuff that you know about. <laughs> right. What you mean? Well, thanks, you have to guys. like pay money for things. You can't just exist <laughs> off the goodwill of the university. That's crazy, dog. And the university promised us that like the, the labs are so cozy. Why don't we just sleep in there and we can, we can eat from the trash. It's fine. <laughs> I'm sure they'd love they if you did that. They would love that because then yeah. they could reduce our problem. Universal, Thank you very much. For universal, yeah, universal freeganism. Oof, true. We just do what uncooked Thank Matthew did. Do breatharianism. Yeah, we can feed, feed on the air, <laughs> photosynthesis. <laughs> well, and like, guys. what is it, raw honey or whatever? So, yeah. Thank you, Loon. Bye bye. Wait, did you say raw honey? Raw Matthew? Yeah. Salmonella Matt? Un- uncooked <laughs> Salm- Matthew, yeah. That's what I was saying, uncooked Matthew. With his oh, raw honey and, and breatharianism, yeah. So. I don't know how you can simultaneously say you're a breatharian too and then also eat raw honey. Like, I wonder if he takes the raw honey and just kind of smells it, you know? And like, it's like he's <laughs> feeling the aura of the breath. Like, like, like an anorexic passing, like the, the you know, the bread aisle or something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You just, uh, you, you smell it, right? Or the, I'm, I'm picturing yeah. Jenna from 30 Rock where it's like, I'm on this great new diet where I just, I think it's from, this might be 30 Rock. No, this is actually, this is not Jenna from 30 Rock. This is uh, um, Emily Blunt's character from The Devil Wears Prada where what she does, what her diet strategy is, is she waits until she's about to pass out and then she eats a single cube of cheese. <laughs> and that's the, that's the diet strategy. Um, obviously, oh my God, don't do that. Just eat when you're hungry. <laughs> Please, like it's so important. Feed your body. It's, anyways. Our next caller, Jackson, is a theist. So I hope you're ready. Um, and this is actually a topic I'm sure Dan is. I saw him in the comments earlier, and I'm sure mm-hmm. he's kicking himself because the next topic is something that I know he would be really interested in. It's not genetic entropy, but Elijah, he, him from Pennsylvania, is a theist, and he says he's asking rather, did scientists discover a change in our DNA from the time of the biblical flood? So eat your heart out, Dan. I'm sorry that you have to to hear about this. Um, And Elijah, welcome. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. How are you? And tell us a little bit about your question. Yes. um, uh, First off, I just want to ask, how are you two doing? We are doing well. Great, great. Um, I've I, I've talked to you, Erica, uh, before uh, through email, but uh, it's it's, it's kind of hard to like you, you know reach you because I know you probably get like thousands of emails. So, man, Elijah, um, yeah, I, I'll just um, uh, you gotta talk a little bit closer to the phone because you're kind of coming in and out. And then also, yeah, I'm I'm like months behind on my email right now. Um, for my guts, a given email, it's really bad. So uh, apologies in advance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes, that's much better. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so um, I'm I'm like kind of agnostic uh, to the idea about you know the question I'm about to ask you because I'm still you know studying you know trying to get to the bottom of it myself. So um, uh, all right, so basically I typed out typed out what I was going to. Uh, Man, say. Elijah, I'm so sorry. You you keep cutting out. Can you hear him, Jackson? Yeah. He keeps cutting out, cutting I, out pretty hard. I can't for me. hear. I I can barely understand what he's saying. <clears throat> Is there? Are you on uh, speaker uh, uh, or something? Could you? Yes. For for now, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. So so I was saying that uh, I had uh, uh typed out my uh. A question uh, before I, I came on, so, so, so I made sure everything was right. I had rewatched the video to make sure I got all the information correct, and 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 also I don't know if you heard me uh, say this, uh, 
or probably cut out, but I had said that I'm kind of agnostic uh, to this idea, and uh, I'm still uh, studying it myself, you know, trying to get down to the uh, to, to the bottom of it, you know, all that stuff. Uh, uh, were, sure, you, uh, sure. were you able to hear it? Yeah, yeah. So, so my understanding is that you're wondering if, if like, the genetic work that has been done <laughs> on, like, ancient DNA and mitochondrial Eve and things of that nature, if that supports, like, a, like a biblical flood, right? Or are you referring to the paper that says that all species originated within the past 200,000 years? Uh, actually, I'm not uh, talking about uh, uh, either one of those things. Uh, I'm actually uh, bringing up the topic of uh, ancient aliens. And so uh, I'm about to read my paragraph to you, and, uh, and um, once I'm done reading my paragraph, uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, what you guys uh, think about this. So uh, uh, are you ready for me to start reading it? I, I don't know that a paragraph's going to work because you're just cutting in and out so bad. Like it, it almost sounds like you've yeah. got like a, like a, like a, I don't know, like a <laughs> problem with your signal or something. Oh, that's weird. I don't, I don't know why. It's something could you? Personal. I'll tell you what. Could you? Um, shoot. How could we? Do, so your 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 question is about ancient aliens. You're you're wondering about whether there's support for ancient aliens. Could we just go with that? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 it had something to do with, um, uh, uh, something that a, uh, uh, evolutionary bi biologist brought up on the, uh, Ancient Alien show, and I wanted to ask you guys about that. Okay, something that evolutionary biologists brought up on the Ancient Alien show. Check. Is there anything else, yeah. any other information you can add before we run with that? Yeah, uh, so, so basically, uh, the, the evolutionary biologist uh, said that he said that early humans have uh, have an unidentified species uh, in, in, in their ancestry. Uh, and then it goes on to say anthropologists from the University of Wisconsin uh, did a comprehensive analysis of human DNA going back many thousands of years, and he found that if you look at human DNA from 3000 BC and look at modern human DNA, it has changed by 7% within the past 5,000 years. Our DNA has evolved at a rate 100 times greater than any previous 5,000-year period in history. And, 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 and what they were trying to say is that they believe that uh, aliens came down and, uh, and uh, mixed their DNA uh, with, uh, with the uh, apes, and, and it created humankind, and you know, Christians uh, believe that this was, uh, you know, the angels coming down, mating with women, you know, during the days of Noah. So I would like yeah, to yeah, the Nephilim, of course. Um, yeah. yes, okay, so Jackson, you 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 start us on this because I'm trying to find this University of Wisconsin guy right now to see exactly what he says. I'm not aware of any data that indicates that. I mean, we have evidence, or we have data on like the rate of evolution in humans, and it's pretty stable and it's consistent with the rate of evolution in like all other primates so I, i'm not really i've never heard of this before at least Neither as far as I, I, yeah, the guy, the, uh, the, the guy's name is, is uh, dr john hogg and they said the location of the university was in uh leipzig germany that's spelled l-e-i-t Z I G. His name is Don. What? Tell me his na his last name again. Uh, Don. Don. Uh, Hog. 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 Yes. H O G. Yes. Okay. Don Hog. <laughs> it's like a fake name. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm checking out. University of Wisconsin, Donald E. Hogg. Nope, that's a firefighter foundation. I, I can't find this guy. But it maybe I'm checking chat. Has anybody in chat heard of Donald Hogg? No, Someone. no, 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 <laughs> not, not, not Donald. Don, Don. D-O-N, Don. No, J O H N. 
John Hogg. Okay, that might be the problem. All right, I'm checking it out. John Hogg, ancient humans aliens. Are modern humans still evolving faster than ever? Is this it? Let's see. I'm seeing a Jonathan Young, but no John Hogg. I'm checking chat to see if anybody has uh, told us about John Hogg. They're searching. <laughs> Help us Is this not? It's not John. Hog. Hold on, it's not Hog. I, Hawks. I think it's Hawks. Oh, I see a John oh, okay. Hawks. H A W K S. Yeah. Is it Hawks? Is it John? Yeah, it's in the I know John Hawks. John Hawks works on. Uh, he's got his blog. He works on um on the Rising Star stuff with Lee Berger. Yeah, he is not an ancient aliens guy, so he, they would have absolutely quote mined him. And my guess is that this has something to do with the idea that Homo Naledi could have potentially contributed some level of DNA um, to modern humans, but that wouldn't be over the past 3,000 years. That would have been 200, 300,000 years ago. John Hawks. Okay, cancel the search, everyone. Jo <laughs> there is no John Hawk. <laughs> um, yeah, so so Elijah, I I'm going to sum this up, I think, the, the best I can understand like what's going on here, right? Which is more or less Jackson's thoughts on it, which is like, we've done just an extensive amount of genetic work on the, like a, just a ton of different people groups, right? Like this was a part of the thousand genomes project, um, which allowed us to kind of create like a, a nice phylogeny of just people from all over the world and helped confirm out of Africa as a, a general idea for how we get modern diversity that is, uh, and, and explains modern diversity outside of Africa versus within. Um, and there is nothing to my knowledge about a 7% strange addition of DNA. Now I know there was a study that is pushed oftentimes by like race realist Robert Sepper um, about there being like a like a ghost lineage that is belonging to a not yet sequenced hominin um, in I believe Northern Africa is where they suppose that this hominin lived. This I've hominin heard of one would have been the Melanesians, but not one in. Interesting. Are, are you familiar? with I don't know about the Melanesian one. The ghost lineage that I'm talking about. Well, the, the Melanesians might be the um, uh, the East Asian archaics that uh, Chris Stringer okay. talks about. Uh, but okay. the the one that I'm talking about is like mm -hmm. uh, it's a ghost lineage from Northern Africa, I believe, and it's something like 12 percent, I think, of of DNA mm -hmm. for some populations. Um, it odds are it's probably just like either introgression or a very very similar to Homo sapiens um, population. Not an ancient mm. alien, unfortunately, <laughs> as wonderful as both that and Bigfoot would be, there is no support for that. Um, not only that, but if it were ancient aliens, why are they using the same like base pairs that we're using? Like, what are the odds? You know, they're just coming in mm. and, and breeding with humans, and they just happen to use adenine, cytosine, guanine, and um, thymine. Like, really, they're just using the same stuff. So my my thinking on that is that there is no support for it. Jackson? Uh, I've never even heard of this before, so. Yeah. Elijah, does that figured. answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah I <laughs> More figured it was, it was, it, it was, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Thank you for calling in. And I'll get back to you no on problem, email problem. one of these days. Take care. All right, thank you. Have a good John yeah, the, Hogg, the, or Don Hogg to John Hawks. What a ride. John, I was like, oh my God, who is Don Hogg? Don Hogg, the famous paleoanthropologist. I, the, the, it, it wasn't Elijah's fault, right? Like the signal was just so like iffy. No, it, I was it like, was. Yeah, yeah. how have I not met this guy? Like, <laughs> like an ancient aliens guy on the level of Jeff Meldrum and his name is Don Hogg and I've never heard of him. That would have been... I mean, honestly, I'm kind of sad that he doesn't make sense to be honest. <laughs> Those ancient aliens guys are are incredible. They managed to take like every di every discovery in like a DNA and spin it to be like, oh, the aliens have come down and tinkered or or bred with humans. And it's like they did it with the um, you remember the the mummies, the Mexican mummies from a couple of months ago. Okay, Jackson, I know you saw this. Uh, is, is they were that like the this one? Tall. They were like memeing on them all on Twitter. They were the ones and in the they, little coffin. They had that thing on them. 
they had like the long skulls, right? Is that the was that it? Yeah, and it if memory yeah. serves, it was actually an alpaca skull turned around in like paper mache. I mean, they had like the, okay. the the morphology of these things was like pretty insane, right? I mean, they had three fingers, mm -hmm. like could they completely violate the tetrapod pattern? They've got like two upper arm bones, like <laughs> instead of the humerus, they've got like a, a radius and ulna up here. It, mm. and they were cobbled together, um, to my understanding, but they did DNA test them. And one of the big things that came out about that, like on Twitter and stuff like that, is they were like, oh my God, like it, there, it's mostly human DNA, but there's also non human DNA in it. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure it's alpaca <laughs> from the alpaca skull <laughs> that makes up this thing's head, right? I mean, but I did enjoy the memes. Uh, they was like uh, these little paper mache. <sighs> mummies and then of course that's putting aside the fact that they probably got the human material from like grave robbing that tends to be a big yeah well. we love that not, <laughs> not great yeah not ideal i would say um folks out there make sure that if you have super chats like you're like oh my god i want to hear more about these um incredible mummies right or you're like i have an ancient aliens question myself that i want to ask or you're Anthony and you want to talk more about the conversation that we had earlier and the support for evolution, please super chat in because it helps the channel. It helps me personally by making me happy and it helps Jackson personally by making him happy. And when Jackson gets happy, he does a little jig. So make sure that you're super chatting as much as, as much as possible. Um, now the last call that we have on the line right now, is John, he, him, pronouns, from New York. He's an atheist who believes in reincarnation. Now that's an interesting uh, combo there and he wants to discuss. So John, you are on Skeptalk. How are you? And can you hear us? Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm well, how are you? You guys hear me clear? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me clear? I just want to make, okay, perfect. Hi, Jackson, how are you doing as well? Oh yeah, doing fine. <laughs> nice to talk to you guys. I really appreciate you guys taking the call. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the difference. Uh, I think it was like three calls ago. Um, you guys are talking about evolution with the, yeah, the yeah, monkeys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, I have stuff that me and my friends, we discuss this every Sunday. We meet up. It's the day that we all happen to be off. Um, we all get together and throw out ideas to see who has maybe similar ones, different ones. And we had a lot of similar ones. And real quick, I just want to ask you and Jack, um, do you believe reincarnation and evolution are mutually exclusive? No. No. I don't think they were overlap. I mean, what's the famous phrase, right? Like non-overlapping magisterium? Magisteria, yeah. I think is the plural, right? Like, I mean, I, there's nothing intrinsically within evolution that's like reincarnation is impossible, um, to my understanding, anyways. Like, I don't, science isn't really equipped to ask supernatural questions like that. Hmm. Okay. Because, all right, so my friend Paul was saying, um, so he, I, I have his notes here. He said, uh, reincarnation and evolution are complementary, not exclusive. Um, he said, <clears throat> it requires physical evolution in the past and the future to create and provide more developed bodies. Um, but what I have to say is, when you look at reincarnation and you look at evolution, the difference is with, all right, so with evolution, I, I can't think of an actual, like, something that clearly makes sense and clicks everywhere. Like, like, you know, no one knows for sure, obviously. You know what I mean? We're all, it's, it's all just guesses. But our guesses have a lot of, obviously not facts, but seem like facts because it, a lot of things add up and make sense. So I'm going to give you one example. Um, you guys were talking about monkeys. Um, how, you know, the chart shows everything. How they evolved and how we became human from them. I don't believe that. I believe, so I, I think, if, if we remember a guy named, um, what was his name? he was a priest. He, he worked in my, uh, he was a priest. What was his name? 
Uh, I think his name was George, Father 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 Floyd. Um, he couldn't breathe because he was a nigger, and I don't like niggers either. So, how do you feel about niggers? I'm dropping this call. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That was a that was like a lot of roundabout just to be a racist piece of shit, wasn't it? Jeez. Yep. God. What's the, what's okay. the what's the benefit of that? Like, what 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 was the idea? Like, who who wins? Because now we just block this asshole and never have to deal with them again. Jeez, Yay. Louise. Yikes. That's a sour note to end on, I think. But you know. Unfortunately, that kind of stuff just happens. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. We got that on the notes. Okay. Well, let's move to super chats. How about that? All and right. if you guys want to take an opportunity, um, I think a really great way to just let this guy have it is to um, super chat something like really cool and positive, and um, you know, don't let that racist piece of shit bring down the show. Like what, what? Who? Like why do you have to be such an asshole? I don't understand that. Like that's just so hateful, needlessly. That kind of shit just really pisses me off. I'm not. I mean, you know, I I do my best not to swear on the show, even though I'm allowed to. I've been given the green light, but it's like, you know, it, just awful. Five dollars from Mahalia Yaga. Would restoring the Bezel Bufo be an invasive species in Madagascar? What would you both bring back if you could? Hashtag Jackson coin. Um, it would only be invasive if it uh, outcompeted uh, native fauna. So if it did not outcompete native fauna, it would not necessarily be invasive. Um, what would you bring back if you could? Uh, <clears throat> I think it'd be very interesting to have, uh, I don't know if I'll steal Erica's answer here. I think it'd be neat to have like Australopiths here. Um, Dude, I think you got to be kidding me. So here's, here's my reasoning for that. Um, Australopiths would give us um, a lot of pause on a very wide variety of philosophic and moral and ethical issues. <laughs> Um, that I think we already should be looking at considering that, um, you know, we have, <laughs> we have chimps and gorillas and orangutans <laughs> in zoos currently. And I think that sh they shouldn't be in zoos, uh, for starters. Um, I think it's, it, I didn't think it was as weird and creepy as it actually is until I like, uh, went to, what was it? The Memphis zoo and saw a bonobo up close and I was like, wow, this makes me feel like garbage. Um, and I think have, if Australopiths were still around or, you know, no, I guess it would have to be them. Cause if not, people could just say, oh, well it's in homo. So it's a human. Um, so we'd have to have like something very close to us, but is not itself a member of homo. And I think that would put into very interesting uh, perspective about you know, ethical issues regarding like animals in captivity. Uh, I think it would be, it would weigh interestingly on like uh, the abortion issue uh, and, and a lot of other things. So that's why I think we should bring back Australopiths. So since he took my case, I'm picking Artipithecus, which is directly precedes <laughs> um, so mine, And so I'm mine, mine is just his answer, but better. <laughs> I think, well, actually I saw it tweet about this the other day that was like wouldn't it be interesting if we if we had all of the hominins like wh which ones would we put in zoos and which ones wouldn't be and i was like which hominins would we put which ones would we put in zoos i hope we're putting none of them in zoos they're hominins like it, you're mm -hmm. you're talking about in its most base like you know you're talking about the this right and like these things have a brain case size that is already quite a bit larger and they often get painted as having one that's like not that much larger than a chimp but the largest specimens get into like 550 cc's, right? Like they overlap with some of the smaller members of genus Homo. So it's like, you're gonna, you're gonna put this guy in the zoo, right? Like, I mean, they could make stone tools. They made stone tools yeah. and you're gonna put, like that just kind of Which blows I mean, my mind. Do I, yeah. They do, yeah. They don't they yeah. don't nap really, but they, um, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess I should have said like they they use they like modify stone um, right, to make right. it, or at least if the Lamequi stuff is legitimate, they they modify stone. But um, I mean, I think yeah, like mammoth and stuff are cool, but I don't know. Just from a a a, a chauvinist perspective, I think it'd be cool to have australopits. I I would bring. I also have like my favorite Miocene apes, but they 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 would be just be like modern apes. Like they a lot of them are not that different from what we have today. They're just like um, their locomotor style is more monkeyish, but other than that, they're they're basically just apes. Um, yeah, Artie Pithecus has weird feet too. I think it would be really cool to see that divergent toe like off to the side. Neanderthals would be interesting as well because then it would be like, but then you're just talking to like a guy, right? Like if you brought back a Neanderthal, this is just some dude who you're like hanging out with. Um, but it would I, be fun. I think, I think the problem with bringing back like um, anything that is like further away from us, like, you know, if you were to bring back like a dinosaur or something, it would be cool <laughs> for like, I don't know, it'd be cool for like 10 whole minutes. I mean, like, yeah, everyone would want to see it. But then as soon as you see it, you're like, OK, I saw the T-Rex, you know, OK, it's cool. It's bigger than I thought, but eh, OK. I, I also have like, what about like Dunkelosteus too? Like it would be pretty epic to see a placoderm or like in my heart, you know, Cotillorhynchus, small head synapsid or Astraspis desiderata, my favorite early like jawless fish. They're so, they're so hideous. I love them. There was one in, um, well, it's not Astraspis, but it's one of the early jawless fish um, in the Life on Our Planet, I think, the Morgan Freeman documentary that came out recently. Uh -huh. But they're so little and they're so cute. I gosh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's hard to pick. The problem is from PhD. Oh no, wait, continue, Sorry. continue. No, I was just gonna say the problem with like bringing uh, with with like um, anything, uh, even I was gonna say anything non vertebrate, even like er, like a, a jawless fish is that I so such a large percent of the population, and I say this as having TA'd botany for a few years, uh, they would just be like, okay a fish you know because like we, we bring them like okay here's all these plants and here are the differences between these plants and this, these are really neat they're just like yeah it's a plant you know? <laughs> so. is it that's so tragic i i um i know i told you this jackson but for like those of you who don't know at the beginning of every semester the icebreaker that i have for my labs is like it's like name major and then like what's your favorite primate and I have to have a picture of primates up there so that they have something to pick from because otherwise their their mind is just static, right? Because it's like a bunch of like 18 year olds and they they hate icebreakers already and it's a high stress mm -hmm. situation. And also most of them don't give a shit. So they look up and they're like, the, the, when I decided to start using the picture was when one kid was like, probably tigers. And I was like, okay, and what's yours? I didn't even bother to correct them like that. I was like, this is like, this was my third lab, right? It's like nine o'clock. And I was just like, I don't have this in me today. He'll learn what a primate is, hopefully, when we teach this class. But um, yeah, like I try to give like a cool fun fact with every primate that we talk about. And it's like, I teach honors now, which is amazing because I used to not. And like, here's my, like, I'm being a little bit of an elitist here, but like the kids that I'm teaching right now are like, whoa, that is really cool. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you're listening to what I have to say. You're enjoying it. This is crazy. Like, you want to hear more cool monkey facts? I got them for days. Like it's being a ta is tough um don't do it if you can avoid it uh or if you just you know really are kind of masochistic 20 dollars from phd tony a key lesson when learning science is respect for the knowledge base and technical expertise of people in their disciplines it appalls me when people frivolously throw around the that's not scientific card at established science yeah i i find that to be pretty frustrating too and like there's nothing like taking like a pinky toe and setting it outside of your discipline and like trying to comprehend something that's not in your normal um like field i guess for for lack of a better word and then realizing like oh my god i i have an undergraduate understanding of this <laughs> like i i i need to brush up if i'm going to be like mouthing off about like geology or physics or something like that and those are the ones that always get me um so yeah i i, I also get a kick out of it when people are like yeah, but that's just not, that's all inference. And it's like, ooh, my brother, it's all inference. <laughs> Jackson, do you have a note on that? Do you want to add to that? On um, the, the people say it's not science for established science. Uh, yeah. As a, as a terminally online person, I'm often, I uh, find myself arguing with, you know, not just creationists, but anti-vaxxers, uh, 
not so much flat earthers. I don't typically run into them. Uh, more like climate change denier, deniers, oh, yeah. nihilists, whatever. Um, I was actually just doing that right before the show. Um, and yeah, this guy was like, oh, yeah, it's um, climate change is, is all a hoax. And I was like, well, what about the data from corals and tree rings and, uh, you know, stalactites and stalagmites and soil samples and ice cores? And he was just like, oh, man, that's that's a big can of worms. But I think it's all a hoax. <laughs> just OK. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's 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 nothing quite um and then you hit them with like a oh do you know like tell me what an isotope is and then they're like well and you're like oh, okay this is I now I know where this this kind of conversation is going great awesome I'm not going to answer your um, evolutionist quizzes to quote um I, uh, uh nephilim free <laughs> <laughs> Was this before or after he ate an entire notebook worth of paper I'm just kidding there's only one piece. <laughs> Just one piece. Lines on paper. Paper thin. <laughs> I wish I had that flip somewhere. I, I searched for it once, but it is lost to time. Perhaps like uh like along many with that clip of it's lost better. along with that clip of, of uh like the the call girls on his tab. So Oh god. Oh I forgot about that one. That Anyways, one so moving good. on. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. From Adam Schrod uh Chodren. Erica, I'm a huge fan. It's my first time seeing Jackson. You should change that. Jackson makes awesome content. You should subscribe to him. Um, that was an awesome turnaround on the concept of inference. You, you're both doing awesome. Thank you so much. But it was all Jackson. Jackson helmed that. I was just getting ready to beat that guy over the head with just talking about like <laughs> a bunch of different like facts about evolution and case studies and things like that. And then Jackson was like, but what if instead we uno reverse card this conversation? Yeah. Um that was first of all how dare you everyone's supposed to know who i am so um <laughs> yeah rj downard um my who's our friend and uh who i co-authored uh, the rocks were there with um he's an advocate for what he calls the the source methods approach so it's basically probing mm. the person um on on what they think rather than what I usually do, and, and what Erica was, she just said was about to do, is just bury them in data, which, <clears throat> which we we typically do. Yeah, you know, they'll bring up a topic, and we'll just absolutely bury them. Um, but sometimes, like with that guy and with the creationist I had a couple weeks ago, you have to like draw them out. You have to say, okay, well, what do you think happened? Give me your thoughts, um, and. They don't. There, there's nothing there. There's no there there. So, I think I think that's also a very useful strategy for like, if you do this for long enough, right? Like the busting creationism, or if it's with climate change or or flat earthers or whatever, you can start to hear little buzzwords that you're like, okay, I know exactly where you got this from. Like I, I know exactly who you're who you're pulling from right now, right? Like, um, there's classic Six types of evolution. Yes, yeah, six types of evolution, right? Um, does a is a dog going to produce a non dog, right? <laughs> it's just there's there's um little buzzwords that can help you clock, and then you're like, oh, okay, like I know generally speaking how informed they are, and then usually they're less informed than that. <laughs> Ten dollars, but from uh, Felicia by nature, I don't know. I don't know what happens when we die, but I like to think we reincarnate into the Marvel universe because I like the Bible. At least comic books can be retconned. <laughs> I would be, um, I would love to be like an ape, an ape superhero and just be human, human woman. <laughs> That's my, my power is I'm just myself. $5 from Parable Liar. Erica, I'm also currently wearing my dissertation, biostatistics and related to phylogenetics. Oh my God, good luck. And I currently hate all about it. Send me luck. Yeah, I, I didn't even see the last part, but like, good luck. There's nothing, um, we actually had a job talk. We've been doing job talks at uh, my university. I, I don't know if you guys do job talks a lot at yours, Jackson, but like whenever we have a new hire, we have to like go meet with the candidate. And then like, we, we talk with them about the graduate school and then we have to go to their talk later in the day. And it's like a great chance to get to know them, but one of the guys who was giving his um his like his spiel he was like doing the icebreakers you know and he asked one of my friends he was like oh, okay like so so where are you at and she was like she studies um in theses 
on um, metacarpals. And she was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I kind of hate my research topic now. And, you know, every time I look at it, it just kind of bums me out. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And she's like, yeah, I think it's kind of just par for the course for uh, writing a dissertation. And then like all of the, or, or thesis for that matter. And everybody in the room was like, yeah, I, I also kind of hate what I'm saying. <laughs> like you love it, but you hate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I know what you mean. It's when it becomes like all encompassing of your life, it makes it I mean, you know, Darwin has that quote, uh, I hate barnacles more than any sailor, you know, because mm -hmm. he yep. wrote, wrote books on barnacles for like, what, eight years, something like that, an incredibly long time. Um, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I don't know. I'm a um, <clears throat> I'm like a general just kind of a broad zoology guy. So uh, wherever I end, I have no preference really. If it's bacteria or fungi or I don't know primates, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. Happy to do whatever. I'm just like I'm happy to help, you know. Jackson, I've never seen someone talk so excitedly about foraminiferans outside of you. Like I feel like you've mentioned foraminiferans okay many it's times in conversations, and then I'm always just like. Oh, Jackson's here. Ask him about foraminiferins. He'll talk for. Hey, if you want to super chat and ask Jackson about foraminiferins, you should do that right now. He could go forever. It's so funny you mentioned that because I was at work one day and uh, I had to cover a station briefly. And this woman comes in and I, I was just, you know, striking up conversation, trying to get them to buy something, whatever. Uh, and I'm like, hey, you know, where, where are you from? Uh, what are you guys doing here? Having, you know, on vacation or something? And she's like, yeah, I meet with my, you know, meet with my parents. I drove in from, uh, I think it was Texas. And she's like, uh, well, I do, uh, I'm in college. It's like, oh, well, what's your major? Micropaleontology. And I was oh, like, oh, whoa, Let's you study like foraminifera? I was like, I love that topic. And she literally said, okay, cool. And walked away. <laughs> oh, Jackson. Oh, my heart just <laughs> broke for you. Oh, no. <laughs> and you were left there at the <laughs> are you seeing like, someone for this? Because that like, uh, that can't feel good. Oh yeah, no, no, I, I, no, I, I'm in a relationship. I was just very excited to meet someone who, no, no, you know, I, is I into... did not mean from a, I did not mean from a relationship standpoint. I meant seeing a therapist for that kind of blow of someone oh. not wanting to talk about parameters. <laughs> yeah, no, I this is much more a serious issue. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I paused. I was just like, oh, <laughs> here's my one chance ever. <laughs> To talk about like <laughs> diatoms with someone at work and they just went cool and walked away <laughs> you gotta hope it that hurt. they're like deep dissertation right now and they're like it or they're doing be. like a master an honors thesis on foraminiferins and they just are sick of talking about them five dollars from larry fishman fishman yeah uh make jackson say i'm a pc jackson a they PC? paid Congratulations, Larry. You got what you asked for. I have no idea. Like a computer? Okay. Five pounds from Dante Solablood. You keep boasting about your P value, but I checked eBay and can't find your P anywhere. Bar successfully lowered, night all. Yeah, I one of these days, I if it would ever if it would even like cap a hundred views, I would make a video on like statistics 101, as far as I understand it. Cause like I I'm terrified of statistics and I feel like my way of understanding statistics is like for people who are scared of talking about it so it would be a useful tool uh but no one who's afraid of stats would ever click on it so I refuse to make it because p-value gets misused all the time <laughs> yeah the uh you, the Donald. most uh like useful class that I've taken I think was biostat uh just like in terms of because most of my knowledge about biology has come from <laughs> you know debunking creationism and and writing videos about zoology and all this stuff um but like biostat when i took that and we had to learn about you know like uh, wilcoxon test and whitney Manu and and all that sort of stuff and i was like yep. wow this is awesome i love this this is so cool um you know like it was all it wasn't even math so much. It was just data analysis, really. And I thought, I was like, yeah. wow, this is really neat. So I, the way that I phrase it is like, okay, like I, I, I sit down. It's like I've got a, I've got my data set, and I'm ready to start. Like it's, it's ready to, you know, load into R. And then I'm like, okay, okay, step one, visualize your data. Like I've got like my mental, like, do go through your check marks from like when I took stats for my master's program. It was like 
we had like this series that was the same steps every time. And it's like my, my mantra to get through the stats. It's like, okay, step one, visualize my data. I can do this. Where's my flow chart? <laughs> like, but you know, it, it, different strokes. Yeah, Cause I still find it very terrifying. $10 from I mean, Jake Nelson. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, well, Jackson, no, you I, just got done saying I love it. So we're not, we're, I'm, we're built well, different clearly. I mean, what, what I mean is like, I, I appreciate the value of it. I guess I should say, I think it's really neat, but I do I also understand scary. that it can be scary. Well, my, my thing is that, okay, like just a good side tangent, right? Like fitting a model, I find to be a very, like, it's an exercise in frustration. I don't like model fitting. That's my least favorite part. Um, and like trying to justify what I'm including and what I'm not and which interactions I'm including and which ones I'm not. So those, anyways, $10 from Jake Nelson. Eric, I watch your videos with my six-year-old, <laughs> the ones where you don't cuss like a sailor anyways. I feel like, okay, I feel like I do pretty well with the swearing. I feel like I, well, not this, this show is a bad example, but I had a good reason to swear. So <laughs> because she loves animals and I want her to see real science and no women can do science. Thank you so much, Jake Nelson. I'm so glad to hear that. And women can do science and have been doing science for a very, very, very long time. Um, I, I have to say, like, um, Erica, you've come quite a ways from that very first email that we had. Uh, God, what was that, like 2018, something like that? <laughs> like 2019? Must have been five, six years by now. Um, it's been a in our minute. Very first conversation on my channel, and your channel is easily one of the best. If you know, it's up there. It's pretty close to the top. One of the best scientific uh, uh, educational channels on YouTube, and I'll fight anyone who says otherwise. Jackson, that is far too sweet, and you're only saying that because you like my my meme game. I I have the I, have I, the I like shit. your meme game. Additionally, it's it's mostly just obscure shit that I see on Instagram. So it's like. It, it, the reason it feels so fresh is because none of none of them are popular. It's always just the stuff that I personally find funny, and then I'm like, oh, I could clip this and use this for the next time. Stand the dankest meme stuff. lord. <laughs> you you hoard your memes like uh, like a dragon with his gold. You know, I sit on uh, I sit on my pile of saved reels and just waiting for an opportunity to deploy them. <laughs> yes, you deserve every subscriber you have. Absolutely, no, everyone. Jackson. And, Jackson and is millions Jackson more. is seriously undersubscribed to, by the way. So you should subscribe to Jackson. If you like what I do, you'll like what Jackson does. So please go forth. Five dollars from Monkey and a Typewriter. Do either of you, as professional biologists, think it's appropriate for an educator to suggest a parent dissect their child asking for a host? <laughs> go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Um, hmm. well, that depends. Are you a parasitic wasp, perhaps, of sorts? Because may, dissect, oh, dissect their child personally. I thought you meant dissect for their child. If you're a parasitic wasp, the answer is always yes. That's what you're doing. But dissect the child specifically? It's a know, Jackson, lawyer has, like, has recommended that I uh, don't answer. So <laughs> It's a reference to something Forrest has said several times. Has it? What, what, what is Forrest, yeah, inform me. What is Forrest saying? He's always He's always off the cuff, isn't he? Yeah, he basically told somebody that when they were asking about uh, how to deal with their child, that they should dissect them. It sounds very and biblical. I don't know. He didn't suggest a vivisection. You can learn so much more. Kidding. Kind of. <laughs> Is that it? Are we good? We're not good. Ten dollars from Cherry. <laughs> Erickson got me with Erica. Got me with feels. Jackson, what's the weirdest animal you love? And does Erica know about it? Oh, Jackson, nothing small, please. Nothing tiny. You know I don't know the small ones. Um. Well, okay. Uh, my previous my answer uh, to this would have been uh, an animal that is now like everywhere and every person knows about it, which is really cool. It's definitely a W for zoology. Uh, axolotls is cool. Axolotls or axolotl, as the nautil would I say. I do like this. Um, but. My other favorite animal, <clears throat> and I cannot pronounce it correctly, um, is the Bashir, Polypterus senegalis. Are you familiar with Bashirs? I think I think I am. Let me tell you. Bashir, if I spell so Bashir it right. is the most uh, 
basally derived extant ray finned fish. They actually still have lungs. That's how basally derived they are. The, the lungs haven't even become the swim bladder yet. Damn, dude. No, I didn't know about this. Is it a Sarcopterygian? Nope. It's a it's an actinopterygian. Is the basal most actinopterygian alive today? Wow! No, I did not know about this guy. Ooh, I like his so fins. Yeah. So, oh, there's actually a really cool study that was done in 2014 by uh, Emily Standen et al. Uh, in which they raised a group of vichiers uh, in a semi-terrestrial environment, and their fins, instead of developing fin rays, the, uh, like other ray fin fish, they actually developed like, uh, sorry, like sarcopterygian lobe fins. Well, that's an interesting connection to the axolotl or axolotl from earlier, right? Where like the environment determines the developmental pathway. Potentially. Yeah, uh, we uh, we did a video um, uh, not too long ago. We did the, the axolotl's tail, which we talked about the uh, the Ambystomatidae, so the family that axolotls mm -hmm. are in, because they're pretty much everybody in that group kind of falls along the spectrum of having like the normal um uh, uh you know salamander life cycle to yeah, like yeah, yeah, increasing yeah. amounts of of like being more aquatically adapted but but yeah uh bashirs we have we have two actually at the aquarium uh and they are super cool we actually named um i i would i used to say bisher was my pronunciation but uh the former curator was like it's actually pronounced bashir so i named it before i knew that i named him bob He's Bob the Bisher, you know. <laughs> so. Oh, Jackson. Do kids yeah. even watch Bob the Builder anymore? Is that is he popular? Or was have, it just I for no millennials? Idea. Bad millennials? <laughs> or Zillennials? Uh, I don't know. I, I've been told I'm not a millennial. I'm 96, so I, I don't know if I yeah, am. Yeah, we're Zoomers. We're Zoomers. We're Zoomers? Damn. Uh -huh. Nice. Um, but, but yeah, uh, so... Bishers, bishers, and, and ropefish, or bishers and ropefish. Uh, those guys are my favorites. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I, these guys are new to me. So my, I will tell you my favorite thing about bishers is their cool fins, and I also really like that they de they have a weird developmental pathway depending on their environment, potentially at least according to you. Did you say it was a study, or was it is like a anecdotal yeah. thing? No, it was it was Emily Standen et al. Twenty fourteen. They they it was a study on phenotypic plasticity in the fins of polypterus. That's dope, dude. And that's actually what they. So I talked about it in a go, go, go. Uh, I know, experimental I hear more evolution about it. part two. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, I want to hear more about it. you know I, I I'm trying to incorporate this this guy into my my new lexicon for basal actinopterygians. What a weird dude! Mm -hmm. It like he looks like a sturgeon. He looks very sturgeon-y to me. Uh, well, sturgeons are also very, uh, uh, very uh, basically derived ray fin fish. You basically have bashirs, then you have sturgeons and paddlefish, which are the next group, uh, and then you have bowfins and gars, which are sister mm. to the teleosts. And then, yeah, within the teleosts, you have a bunch of you have like your uh, like carp, eels, arapaima, arowana. Um, and we actually did a video recently where I talked about the evolution of of the swim bladder. And I, a part of that was about uh, discuss the the Bashirs. Um, so that was the Pike's tail um, on my channel. So if you want to know about the evolution of swim bladders and how it's changed as fish have become more derived because they've changed their swim bladder. But the cool thing is the the swim bladder of very derived uh, teleos recapitulates its evolution. So it has the connection to the esophagus which is also what our, our lungs are attached to. Uh, but it, the connection gets severed as they get older. So it's like, it's like the original, the, the primitive condition, and then it loses that connection. So, okay, cool fact there, right? Like human infants also recapitulate the, um, the basal ape condition where they, their larynx is like seated much lower, right? They, they, they have mm -hmm. the chimp condition. Uh, and then as they grow, the larynx sort of stretch, you know, everything stretches out around it. And then they've got a, a nice speech capable uh, system, which is really weird, but reminds mm -hmm. me of that. $10 from Jake okay. Nelson. Subscribe to Betsy Gibbon and Jackson Wee. You wish not regret it. Thank you both for all your content. Thank you, Jake. We appreciate it very much. 
$5 for monkey at a typewriter. What's your favorite horrifying biology fact? I love angler fish breeding. It's some James Cameron alien level shit. Love both of you guys. It is, I also love angler fish breeding. It's very funky. Um, but for like horrifying, I've got to go with traumatic insemination in bed bugs where they just, um, <laughs> the, the way their insemination works is like the, uh, the, the the fertilization, if you will, or in for lack of a better, it's just insemination, right? Like for for the ejaculation mm -hmm. to happen, right? They just kind of poke their their ovipositor, right, directly mm -hmm. through. Would you call it a carapace? The just like the, the, the body, exoskeleton, the, just the exoskeleton yeah. generally. Yeah, they just yeah. shoot it through, like a puncture it directly into the body, uh, and then mm -hmm. I guess the sperm just find their way to the egg in there, and it's it's all good. But um. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. like traumatic insemination as well is just very metal as a as terminology. So that's that's my favorite one of my favorites. What's yours, Jackson? Favorite horrifying fact. Um I think uh maybe the um the ichneumonid wasps, uh the group that you know famously uh caused Darwin to question the existence of God. Um they <laughs> their actual mode of attacking caterpillars is even more insidious than people tend to think. Because when you think about it, you're like, okay, well, I mean, they, you know, they inject their eggs into some unsuspecting caterpillar, and then the caterpillar gets eaten from the inside out. And you're like, yeah, that's pretty terrible. Oh, it gets worse. The reason that the, uh, that the eggs are able to, uh, basically uh, get in there and not get like kind of wiped out by the caterpillar's immune system is the caterpillar's immune system gets flattened by virus, by a virus that the wasp injects additionally into the caterpillar. So there's a, a virus uh, within it that then shuts down the caterpillar's immune system and prevents it from taking out the, uh, the eggs of, of the, um, of the the wasp and what's cool is some caterpillars survived that encounter because those viruses which uh, are uh, called bracoviruses if i remember correctly it's b-r-a-c-o bracovirus are in butterflies now or in lepidopterans i should say more broadly so and uh, so those, is it is it like incorporated it's an endogenous retrovirus yep it's now in that's the it, bracoviruses are so now cool. in the lepidopterans mm -hmm. That is really cool. I did not know that. Epic. $5 from Mahalia Yaga. An actual reincarnation question. Yes, thank you. If reincarnation is real, but nobody remembers their past in many, any meaningful way, why does it even matter? Um, this is how I feel about free will, actually. Like, I, if free will is real or free will isn't real, it feels real to me, and so I don't care. Um, that conversation has never been interesting to me personally. Uh, and this is the same way, actually. So thank you for it. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Same for uh, the the brain and a vat thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fifteen dollars from Fate of Silver. Love your content, Erica. I've learned so much thanks to you and other great YouTube personalities. I have gotten so much more out of science and religion ever gave me. That is so lovely to hear. That's that's um that's our goal as science communicators, right? Like it's the entire purpose is like okay, you know we have access to this information through whatever means, right? Like Jackson has his specialties and I have mine, and it's like. This should be available to everybody, right? Everyone should be able to think how epic all this shit is. So $5 from Dante Solo Blood. If you could bring back any species, oh, if I could bring back any species, it would be the thousand-footed bear. <laughs> Just the thought of it gave a lot of pause. The thousand-footed bear. A lot of pause. Bring back uh -huh. from Very funny. Boo. Oh, oh, that is foul. Banned. <laughs> 1999 from JV Gallier. Go off, Erica. Great response uh, to that loser troll. Here's a coin. We'd love to hear both your opinions on pseudoscience shows like Ancient Aliens. Yeah, that guy sucked. Um, and that, like, I, I just don't like again. Like, what a what a waste of time. You you what a joker. You really have to be a, a basement dwelling asshole to think that something like that is like influential in any way. It's just a nuisance. It, it's like a fly that you squish and then move on with your day. It's unpleasant, but you know that they were inconsequential from the start. Um, Jackson, 
opinion on pseudoscience shows like Ancient Aliens? Um, mm, mm, here's my extremely uh, cold take on Ancient Aliens. Ice cold, in fact. It's, it's sub-zero. Um, Ancient Aliens is thinly veiled racism. I know a lot of people are into it, uh, and it's you know Crazy. it's fun to think about it. But like, and and I've told I told it to um, oh shoot, what's his name? Uh, D- Dan, um, really tall guy. Um, he has a uh, he has an atheist show or did I don't know if he still does. His name is Dan. He's really tall. I, maybe someone in the chat can throw it out there. I, I forget his last name. Um, but. Uh, I, I mentioned that to him, or I had said that, and someone, or and he kind of came along and was like, hey, what, what did you mean when you said that? And what, what I mean is, <clears throat> things that are, uh, or structures that are, that were made by, by white people, uh, typically don't get ancient aliened, but if they were made by black or brown people, they get ancient aliened, like the pyramids, the ziggurats, um, the Great Wall of China, whatever it is, Cahokia. you know, it's the what? I said Cahokia even in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, exactly. If it's if it's <laughs> objectively Dan, there we go. Thank you. Um, but yeah, like it's it's all aliens had to do it because they couldn't possibly, even though we have now um like we know enough about uh these time periods that we can make uh the tools that they would have used to build the pyramids we know where they excavated the limestone to build the pyramids we have a variety of different methods for how they could have moved those blocks uh and how they could have you know stacked them on top of each other and whatnot um slave labor lots and lots and lots of slave labor that's what it took <laughs> it, or corvée labor there's that too if you, you would just be like hey uh, you could get a, a tax break if you but that was for only some of it and mostly mastaba related but but still yeah i mean and uh, with the um with like stonehenge and stuff too which is one of the few ones that <laughs> That they okay, don't Stonehenge. Tend to, uh, yes, uh, Stonehenge is one of the few that's like, oh, okay, like it's it's European, but like, oh, it might right. be ancient alien. Like you can track down the exact blocks, like you know exactly where they come from from Stonehenge, and then they've got these big round logs, and it's like, wouldn't you know it? If you set a block on a, a set of round logs and then you roll it, it can go from point A to point B. Wow, that's crazy. That's just nuts. And wow, it to blow your mind even more multiple people groups figured this out huh yeah. so you can make any kind of big structure wild or you can do the easter island thing where you walk it by pulling it from side to side you know mm. i mean like you and we can do this today it's just throwing like like jackson said you throw enough human life at something and you can make it happen <laughs> isn't that round wonderful? object go burr <laughs> yeah round object go burr ten dollars from smokes a lot of weed 420 nice cough animal slavery cough also, you can yeah. do that too. Yeah, you just you can throw animals at it too. Four ninety nine from Philip Kelly. Screw that guy. But real question: Are there cryptozoological animals that could be possible? Um, yeah. I mean, like there there are cryptids that like used to be cryptids that are no longer cryptids. Like when the when the Okapi was first described, they were like that shit is not real. You're, you're telling me it looks like a mix between a zebra and a giraffe. Yeah, the platypus, gorillas, when they were initially described, were like, they were like, oh, it's like a big chimpanzee, but it's only in this one specific area. They were like, no, that that's not real. And then lo and behold, right? So yeah, all the time. If at present there is a large mammal that is roaming the Pacific Northwest and we just happen to never find any scat, fossils, bodies, or otherwise like eDNA even, I find that to be pretty unlikely, mostly just because of the 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 latter half, right? Like I think I'm one of the, I'm probably in the top 5% of people who would w- love for Bigfoot to be real. Oh my God, because it would definitely be Paranthropus, right? Like it would 100% be Paranthropus. People are always saying it's Gigantopithecus. No, it would be Paranthropus. It already has the morphology. You just have to size it up. It's even got the sagittal crest, for goodness sakes. This is a perfect, it's a perfect setup, um, but no, eDNA studies pretty outright preclude that possibility. Um, and what's what's cool is they did the same thing in Loch Ness and they were like, mm-hmm. not, Jackson knows this, this story, right? But they do like an eDNA study in Loch Ness and they're like, it's normal lake stuff. And then one very weird finding that there was either 
a couple of very large or multiple very small eels living in Loch Ness. Mm -hmm. There's just a, an eel population there. And like mm -hmm. eels can get pretty big, even if they're, you know, freshwater eels, right? So it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Is that, is the eel a described eel? I'm pretty sure it is, but you know, yes. still that's super neat. Um, maybe some deep sea stuff, but again, it's not going to be very large in my opinion. Jackson, you have any crypto hot takes? Uh, my hot take on cryptozoology is I'm honestly, uh, it bores me. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. I'm like, I'm the one, I'm the one zoology guy who's like, yeah, I don't find cryptozoology interesting. I, it's kind of my, of so that kind of like funnels into my thoughts on conspiracy theories generally is like kind of wow. towards all people ask on Twitter all the time where they're like, you know, what's a conspiracy theory that you find interesting? And my response to that is always none of them. I don't find I don't find untrue ideas to be interesting. Um, I'm sorry. Wow. Like, that's just me. I don't I'm maybe I'm just not imaginative. Um, but if it's if there's evidence for a thing. OK, uh, if there's not evidence for a thing, then I'm and especially if people are like, no, this is real. And they argue for it based on like really bad uh or you know like uh like terrible lines of evidence or whatever then i'm like no i definitely don't like that uh so sorry i, I <laughs> that's why i love take. every single one <laughs> I, there isn't a cryptid out there that i don't love i i love the from the most plausible that are still not very plausible like a like a sighting of a tasmanian tiger in like the 80s or something like that mm -hmm. all the way to the fresno nightcrawler give me all of them i want every cryptid i want to know where the sighting was i want to, i want the plushies or the 3d prints of it i want to put stickers on my laptop of it i love cryptids i don't believe in any of them probably i don't i can't think of any that i believe in but i you know i love them i think they're great five pounds from grimbeard what is the deal with the saber-toothed deer? Um, so chevrotain, so it's a type of tragulid. Uh, sexual selection, that's the deal. Um, so actually most, like a lot of your little artiodactyls used to have like decently sized canine teeth and males used them to compete. Um, and then you get this really interesting shift where you go from having, like it turns out when you have really big canine teeth, right? It's, it's very difficult to have strong jaws. Like typically um, you can kind of think of a muscle like a rubber band, like if it can stretch really easily, then it doesn't tend to be very powerful. Um, and if you're an artiodactyl, like a little deer, you need to have a lot of strong chewing muscles, right? Because you're sitting there grinding up grass all day. So you've got these big canines that are useful for you to fight with, um, and they were a sexually dimorphic trait. But then it's like, okay, well, if you could get rid of the canines and compete in a different way, then you can just have little stubby incisors and chew to your heart's content and fight in a different stupider way, which just so happens to be <laughs> antlers. And they clap them together and they get them stuck and it's really dumb. And there's actually a single species of cervid where the females also have antlers and it's reindeer. And what's really weird about that is that females keep their reindeer during, um, during the winter months. And the reason that we think that is the case is because they live up in an area where there's not very many resources. So females can actively defend patches of like grass with their antlers when they have um, a baby that's lactating. So it's like pretty, there's like a, a strong selection for them to maintain those antlers um, and defend feeding grounds. So mm. I like that. It's, it's, it's a different look at what could have been with primates. Imagine if you had antlered monkeys instead of big canines and monkeys. $4.99 from Adam Schroden. Schrodron, sorry. The super chat is dedicated to thanking all black people for their historic and ongoing contributions to sign culture. Thank you all. Thank you. And fuck that guy. This is they, this is a perfect fuck you to that guy. Thank you very much, Adam. Okie dokie. $10 from SJL fiction book recommendation. A different flesh. Harry Turtle Dove. Europeans arrive in the Americas to find Homo erectus instead of Native Americans. Treatment was as horrible as you imagine. Yeah, people often ask. Um, or like I've gotten plenty of emails asking me like, what would have happened if Neanderthals had survived to present? It's like, we're 99.9% .9 similar to one another, genetically speaking, and look how horrible we treat each other, right? Like we find ways to do tribalism in one of the least genetically diverse mammal species out there. Some of those other hominids did not stand a chance um, for better or for worse for the sake of humans, right? Like we just, we either outcompeted them or bred them out of existence or skirmished with them, whatever. But unfortunately, I don't think that that was ever gonna come to fruition, which is so sad, <laughs> but there it is. 
I I actually read a, a series by Harry, Harry Turtle Dove, and I follow him on Twitter. He's really cool. Um, mm. So he writes a lot of of like alt hist uh, sort of stuff. Uh, and mm. one that I read was yeah. So he he wrote a series that was like, what if aliens landed during World War II and all sorts oh, of other stuff. Be- um, but my I, I read a series of his that I really enjoyed. Um, it was it's titled the Southern Victory series. So it's like, what if the South had won the Civil War? What would how mm. would World War One and then later World War Two have been different? You know, uh, and it it basically starts from the first book is like the eighteen like seventies or eighteen eighties, and so it works its way uh, from like the perspectives of a bunch of different people uh, all the way up to like the end of World War Two. It's a really a really interesting uh, series. And I know that there, there's a bit of controversy around it, but I, I think it's a really mm. interesting series and worth reading anyway. So, <clears throat> Five dollars from It's a Rubik's could be worse than undergrad when I would tell people I'm an anthropology major and they would ask, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. I know that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Five dollars from Larry Fishman. It was an Apple advertising campaign from the 2010s. It didn't occur to me until after I sent it you mo- but, but you both might be too young to remember it. So when you said you're a PC, uh, it's from an advertiser. I mean, I use I use PC. I've never been a Mac person, so. I'm also a PC user. $5 from Jake Nelson. Jackson, talk to me about diatomes. My daughter's beta fish tank keeps getting them. How do I get rid of them? Jackson, you, diatomes. You don't. Now. <laughs> I don't I don't think you do honestly. I mean <laughs> we um uh, so at the aquarium um uh I they some of the husbandry people have been like cuz I'm just taking random water samples cuz we went in the uh, the microalgae lab for the botany lab um so we do like you know bacteria one week and then we do microalgae one week and then macroalgae and so I don't like that that distribution but another story um anyway so for the microalgae i'll take i'll just take a random water sample from one of the tanks and we'll look at it it's usually got like stentor which is a ciliate uh which is a really cool guy um because he kind of bounce around uh and it'll have other little ciliates that you kind of see them swimming around and usually we'll have diatoms in it um and so the husbandry people said oh well how do we get rid of them (laughs) yeah you you don't (laughs) they will outlast us um yeah, I mean, you know, make sure as long as you make sure that like the 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 water parameters of your tank are fine and that you're not overfeeding them or whatever, uh, then your fish are going to be fine. I mean, you're not going to get rid of your diatoms. Sorry, they're here to stay. Sorry, Jake. Four ninety nine from Eli. I just got into WCU to study anthropology. Nobody even knows what it is. I'm so sorry to hear that. I know what it is, and congratulations. Uh, also, Jackson, I'm sure you'll find someone to discuss micropaleontology with. Oh, I, I do. Um, yeah. Uh, my, I, I talk to my, my partner, Camilla, about it uh, all the time. So I was going to say, Camilla is very micropaleo friendly, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she, we're, we're both <laughs> biology. So, yeah, so we, we talk about all sorts of, of things, uh, you know. Does she have a threshold of like, I can handle this much diatome talk in a day. If she does, she hasn't told me yet. So <laughs> you haven't um, reached it. So you're good for now. I and and like yeah, she's. I uh, I often read uh, like stuff that I write like to like I'll do a script and then I'll go over it with her. Uh, you know to make sure it doesn't sound bad or whatever, and and so she'll listen. Uh to that and and she puts up with it and and so far she hasn't (laughs) told me this stuff so you you hit the partner jackpot luke also puts up with an infinite amount of primate talk from me infinite sometimes oh my god like this is when i knew i hit the lottery sometimes he asks questions and i'm like (gasps) 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 you're like let me tell you (laughs) i was like listen (laughs) Fifty dollars, holy mackerel, from Courtney Lord. One thing to consider: read the possibility of a non-theistic universe is an omnipotent God is itself a theological explanation for a question which can only be answered otherwise with science. Anthony may as well ask why evolution is better than solipsism. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I did not understand 
like his his direction with that right because like it seemed extremely solipsistic to me and like Jackson you hit the nail on the head I, you said it at one point I don't think he heard you because you kind of said it like low but it's like okay like how do you tell the difference right like yeah I think he was talking it, when I said uh the last Thursdayism thing yeah yeah it, it's like if it's indistinguishable from evolution then how can you know anything yeah I mean it is it becomes solipsistic it becomes a waste <laughs> of time Aaron uh, has made that point. He, I don't remember. It, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but he mentioned, uh, like, uh, he's told this guy, by the end of the conversation, you're going to deny that, like, we can know anything about biology. And then by the end of the conversation, the guy was like, oh, maybe we can't know anything about biology. And, he's like, yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes in Twitter conversations, the uh, the creationists, and I'm sure you've seen this too, uh, creationists <laughs> will run to, uh well maybe similarity doesn't imply descent and then you have to say okay so we don't we can't do paternity tests then no well, exactly. well similarity in that case uh, uh implies descent okay so similarity implies descent sometimes but not other times and and then you kind of then you have to like you know get them to eventually figure that out that's when it becomes the where's the line and why is it drawn there right like what is it what is mm -hmm. evolution capable of producing and what is it not capable of producing right i mean i like and it's funny because like because of the arc especially with the young earth creations right like they have to invoke an obscene amount of morphologic change in zero mm -hmm. time so it's like it, the problem isn't that they don't like the mechanism right the problem as and this is what i think it always boils down to with young earth creationists at least is that it's like okay you don't think the earth is old right and then it's like heat problem let's have that conversation every single time it it becomes uh, and a radiometric dating and a heat problem kind of situation. And wouldn't you know it, that always ends with a solipsistic, how do we know that things used to, that quantum physics operated the same in the past, in the past as it does right now. And it's like, <laughs> you have to give a reason why it doesn't, my brother. Like, it, otherwise this is not gonna work, right? We, in the, the conversation that Dapper and I had with that creationist a few weeks ago, he we actually got him to admit that miracles are required uh, for the earth to be young. He was just, uh, like um, we brought like we got to diatom or, or diatoms <laughs> diatoms on the brain uh we got to index fossils which includes yeah. diatoms uh and we sure. we explained to him like you know this is these are what index fossils are uh this is how we can know that the earth cannot be young and then he tried to pull the well you know maybe deposition was fast then dapper was like no because here's all the math for mm -hmm. the heat problem and so he was like well maybe it was just a miracle. Maybe God got rid of the heat. It's like, but well, okay then. I I guess you've lost. You've just conceded the argument. Cool. I'm always like, couldn't we have started with that, right? Like, because at that point, and I I won't speak for you, right? But I become completely uninterested. Like the second you're like, oh yeah, miracles could explain this. I don't care. We're not yeah. talking about like anything even close to scientific anymore. What makes young earth creationism right. and creationism right. generally fun to engage with is when they're like not only decide like not only can we make this work with science but it's a better argument than conventional science and that is just right. tantalizing that is a fun conversation to have uh because it's it's such nonsense but once miracles get involved it's like oh bye bye i don't care i'll be over here talking to someone who's more fun um <laughs> Five dollars from monkey to typewriter. Here's a question that may generate some controversy around these parts. You both say you don't identify as anti-theists. Can I ask why? Monkey face. <sighs> My reason is pretty simple. I I'm just not very educated in like the, the pros and cons of like religion's influence on society. Like I, I know that there's a great amount of harm that's been done because of religion in so many parts of the world. At the same time, I have a lot of people in my life who are religious, and it seems like for them individually, like their spirituality adds a lot to their lives and they're happy with that. Um, and so like from where I'm sitting, I don't think that I've sat down and like looked into the personal impacts of religion on individuals who do say that they get something out of it and weighed that from a utilitarian standpoint against the, um, the massive harm that it's done at a large scale and then there's also the problem that like there's other things that have done harm on a large scale that aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves um so that's that's my person i just don't think i'm educated enough to take a stance on it um yeah i i agree with that uh assessment i mean religion does does actually there, there's a lot of research on this um it's like you know psychology and sociology of religion 
religion does actually provide a lot of beneficial functions uh, in society. It, it is very good at like coalition building. Uh, it people who are like lifelong religious, especially, um, are often very good about like giving to charity, uh, participating in soup kitchens, and and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of of, of positive uh, factors um, that have been shown sociologically. There's a lot of research in that. And uh, inspiring philosophy is usually one who can find a lot of that stuff very quickly. So, um, <clears throat> and and also, I've met other atheists. <laughs> Do I think like, oh yeah, the world would just be better if religion were gone? No, it wouldn't. Uh, maybe some things would be better. Like, okay, maybe young earth creationism would be gone. Fine. But uh, like, uh, I don't, I mean, like grand scheme, anti-vax stuff is way worse than young earth creationism. And the predominance of that comes from, from what I've seen, non-religious people. Uh, so like, I think it's it depends on the sect, I think, because like there, it, it used to be hundred yes. percent. I used to like it used to be hundred percent agree with you, but there's been a recent influx. I think because of the political affiliation and the pandemic that has yes. caused. That's but, true. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, right wing uh, like evangelical groups can also get caught up in the anti-vax stuff. That's ve that's very true. Um, but yeah, for a long time, <clears throat> prior to prior to the pandemic. Um, anti-vax stuff, anti-GMO, the, the natural life site, uh, lifestyle was all very left-wing stuff. And I'm, I'm a left-wing person, you know, it, 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 you know, much to my chagrin, uh, but it's true. Mm. Uh, and then it wasn't until the pandemic when you had like Trumpism and all this other stuff that suddenly that dynamic, uh, not so much on the GMO side, uh, but the anti-vax stuff definitely like switched parties. Um, and so they've always I, had a monopoly on the climate change stuff, though. The evangelicals have always yes, owned yes, the climate that's change true. stuff. I mean, so you had, kind of and, and and you had people on in who you had people who were Democrats, like uh, like uh, William Proxmire, who were yeah. opposed to like any science that was um, like not immediately like oh. If, you're studying fruit flies. Well, why? Why are you studying fruit flies? That what's that going to do for us? You know, uh, it, I'm sure he would have said that to like Thomas Hunt Morgan, and then decades later, his fruit fly research resulted in medical genetics as we know it. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's like you know, just because you can't immediately see what is you know the benefits of some line of research doesn't mean that it's useless. Um, but yeah, I mean, like there are there are aspects of religion that are that can be negative. Uh, but there are also a lot of aspects of it that can be positive, and I don't think that being atheist is, makes you a good person. I don't think that it makes you more intelligent, uh, or you know that that the world would just be better off if no religion existed. No, people would still find ways to be uh, racist or, or you know exclusionary and whatnot. That wouldn't go away. Those are just inherent parts of human society, as we said earlier. Monkeys fight, so you know. Monkeys fight. And we are regretfully monkeys. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. I love that. Us being monkeys, not the fighting part. <laughs> well, folks, that is the last Super Chat. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Despite some snafus, I hope that you'll all move forward and, and uh, live a compassionate and understanding life, despite the fact that, uh, you know, ding dong goobers roll in here and just um, uh, troll and, and try to bring the stream down and act like a, a doofus. So, um, you know, Live to spite people like that. Be kind to others and uh, and continue on your merry way and don't let them get to you. But before we go, Jackson, please plug your channel a little bit. Let us know where we can find you and the things that you like to talk about. Because I don't know if you did it on the, you were on the hang up? It was the hang No, it was the Sunday show. Yes. It was the hang up. Uh, I think it was, it was, I believe it was the hang up with Matt. Did you, did you plug yourself? Plug yourself anyways. Do it anyways. All right. Um, Yes, my channel is Jackson Wheat. It's just my name. I'm not cool enough to, or, or imaginative enough, as I said earlier, to come up with some cool uh, nickname for myself like Erica has done. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I'm just me, uh, Jackson. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I think it's like Jackson Wheat One, and then my YouTube channel is just Jackson Wheat. So, because um, I'm the one and only, I'm the number one Jackson. Jackson uh, Wheat, number one. <laughs> Yep. Um, but yeah, Jackson Wheat. So I do zoology uh, and evolution. Uh, we're doing a, a series on my favorite 
book, my favorite nonfiction book, I guess I should say, which is The Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong, in which we go backwards through time uh, from today and, you know, all the way back to our common ancestor with all of life. And so I'm going through through this book chapter by chapter. Hell yeah. yeah you've been at that for a while, too. It's a long it's series. Like two There's years. <laughs> but all the the videos are so concise like i i cannot wrap my head around a concise video that's not my strong suit but you know whatever I, my character and i've already really picked out what my next book is going to be um i I, I found a, sure sure I, I mean unless you don't want me to so, no i want you um, to because i want to know i'm curious <laughs> i um so as i said earlier i get into fights with people about climate change um and i think that's another demonstrably uh more dangerous uh conspiracy theory than like young earth creationism or flat earth um and so i want to delve into that uh and go through it comprehensively next uh which is uh, it's a book that came out in in 2017 titled inconvenient facts al gore doesn't want you to know which is a oh wild book title for something published in 20 the year of our lord 2017 if it were published in like yeah 2000 2001 okay that would make sense but no a full like 20 years later and he's still molding about al gore so it's like the it's the this is, it's the this is fine meme you know it's like things are like i feel like i can't even i can't even step outside without the the dread creeping and i'm like Oh boy, it's February and I'm in a tank top. This is not good. Like this is there's daffodils trying to poke through by my mailbox. Bad. Not a good sign. But you know what, folks? Um, you know, it starts with you. Talk to people about climate change. Vote with climate change in mind. All of this is important stuff to do. Um, there's going to be damage, but it doesn't have to be irreparable. So we can weather the storm yeah, together I, as well as these. I just want to provide some sort of you know, some sort of, of series where I can respond to like all of the major, um, Hell yeah. all the major arguments and, and not, and, you know, not be like, uh, disrespectful or like flippant about mm. the response that I want to actually, I want to do what Dan does you know, and what you also do you and, and Dan and Zach uh, Hancock and Dapper, like embrace their arguments head on and be like, okay, let's look at the data together. Let's go mm. through this you know, line by line, see what the data actually says. Uh, you know, let's run the analysis together and, and see what our what our what our, our results are. So I, I immensely respect your, your ability to do that. Listen, it's I wish I could say it was out of altruistic duty, but most of it is pettiness. <laughs> most of most of my motivator, I'm motivated extremely Masochism. well by like all right. It, it's more like this guy's going to come out here and waste an hour and a half of my time when I clicked on their video to watch it. I'll show him. I'll spend four hours going line by line on this video because people are narcissistic. They always watch it. And it's very funny to watch the decompression after that. Um, anyways, you guys, please take care of yourselves this week. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Skep Talk. And um, Oh, I almost forgot the super thanks thing. Jimmy would kill me if, if I forgot about it. He wouldn't, but I would feel bad about it. Don't forget, if you're watching this video after it's already out, you can do a super thanks. They're enabled on these videos. It's a great way to help the channel and keep the lights on, things of that nature. And so my gentle and of course, very modern apes, please take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. And then you gotta dance this part. Yeah, there you go. You gotta do a little bit of this. Yeah, there it is. And then eventually the lights turn off. It's like...